And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I, with me is my good brother here in the temple, the ma the man who probably would want to commission a T-shirt saying "Kill J Kill." <laughs> The 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 Mr. Hockey of the of the monastery, <laughs> and some and somebody who who um is smart enough to not sing Despacito, unlike Sid. Oh God! <laughs> oh God! Yeah, I had to, I had to sit through that. Um, you poor bastard! <laughs> I'll give Sid the A for effort. Never do that again. Better. Don't quit your day job. <laughs> but good, good brother Maddie is here. This is, of course, a special because it's not Sunday, and well, Sunday is going to be reserved for bullying video, bullying video game auteurs because we haven't had, we haven't done a good bullying in a while. Especially, especially to some, especially to somebody who believes that they're creating arts, which is which. Um, pro tip, everybody. Never, unless you're actually out there painting or sculpting or what have you, don't say that you're creating art. You're just going to end up pissing everyone off or having them laugh at you or both. Um, as a as a as a quick side note, Maddie, um, I ended up getting a I ended up getting a few li a few links from some from some mutual from some mutual friends of the temple who have been have been. Laughing at pe at people moving from ca moving from California up to the nor up to the northern states and complaining about the winter. <laughs> and us two look at that going, ah, oh, you're cute, <laughs> pussies. Um, in some cases, complaining about like see, like forty degree weather, and I'm like, yep, pussies. They haven't been what in absolute zero temps yet. Mm -hmm. No, the oh they will, because remember January's coming, and she's pissed. Mm -hmm. Although, although um, if they can't ha if they can't handle winter, I can't help but wonder how they'd handle um, moose and deer. Oh, be careful with the fucking polar bears, bud. <laughs> okay, they're just bears, and then they're covered in snow, and they actually don't do shit in winter. They're hibernating. Yeah, but yeah. Lord, 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 help you if 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 you wake them up from their hibernation. They they are extra cranky. Mm -hmm. About worse than either of us when we get when we get woken up early, early by bullshit. What's the definite uh, definition? What, what do you count as bullshit, folks? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Anything that wakes us up too early, bullshit. Yeah. Even if even a convention, though, we will begrudgingly accept it and go in line and get excited. Mm -hmm. We just need coffee. Yeah. Or tea or caffeination. Well, it's the, it's the reason I. Get, why do you Why do you think I always get two plates at, Co at Continental every morning? Mm-hmm. Which, it is, to this day, it is still funny as hell that sh that Shades thought, I, Shades thought I wouldn't have room for lunch getting two plates. He's like, I'm like, you have no idea, you have no idea what you are dealing with. See, that's the difference between us big dudes. You're a natural big dude. You eat like a big dude. Yeah. I eat like a fat fuck. <laughs> oh. But... And even and even with that, there I know I know that I I'm not going into any eating contests. I'll put it I'll put it that way. No, n none of us would. No, we. But we're not here to talk. We're not here to talk about eating, yet. <laughs> we're here. We're here to talk about what will pr what will probably go down as the most influential promotion of the of the last twenty years. A promotion that, a promotion that managed to survive in spite in spite of everything that got thrown against it, especially in those early days. Because with the with the with the with um final battle, the their big end of year pay per view, 
um, coming and going, and that's supposedly being the end of some of some era. I figured this was an, a nice enough time to look back at Ring of Honor, hence the hence the title of this week's um this particular monster special, ROH: A Legacy of Honor, and I. As usual, the best spot to begin is at the, well, beginning. And there you go. From, and so obviously, obviously, both of I would say that both of us didn't start didn't start out watching watching ROH with an era of honor begins. I'm not I'm not going to claim to be that level of hipster. No, 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 a whole. You'd be very lucky to be. This was a very local company that had some distribution, mm -hmm. as far as uh, this uh, international distribution, thanks to a lot of places, including High Spots, among other places. Mm -hmm. But Ring of Honor started at just like a local indie that, in response to, of all things, the end of of the Monday Night War and the the subsequent. Uh, demise of wcw and ecw uh well whereas tna was literally jeff jarek putting in his uh his quarter mill he got from uh from fucking over vince mcmahon which as time goes on you realize that that has more satisfaction attached to it than it should mm -hmm. tna was okay we're not an indie we're going straight up big boys they weren't eventually but the idea was there that this was not just a local indie. This was going to be a big indie, big fucking deal. Mm -hmm. Ring of Honor started really as an indie. It, that there, there's a reason why it inevitably became what what was was inevitably called a super indie. Uh, but the idea that the basic idea was there. Uh, rule set was very Japanese influenced. Ten count, twenty count on the floor. Uh, you know, you have till five. The, the pitfalls and everything else was. And at the very beginning, they didn't have the traditional uh, three turnbuckle setup. They had what New Japan has with the boxing, kickboxing pads as the uh, turnbuckle pads. They started with that as well. The uh, And obviously, Ring of Honor, like it was very honorable. Everything was kept in the ring as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the code of honor, the shaking hand, the, the sportsmanship, the shaking of hands, before in every uh, matchup, mm -hmm. uh, and if you were a heel, you utilize that as a great bit of heat by by avoiding the uh, the, uh, the, the 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 handshake for a kayfabe fine, of course. But that's a you know that's the basic gist of it. It's like okay, here and Gabe Sapolsky, who was a disciple of Paul Heyman uh, for with with the ECW days, he he's the one who kicked it, who kicked off uh, the the he. Created, he was he, he was one of the founding fathers, fathers, along with Kerry Silken of Ring of Honor. Basically, they said, "Okay, wrestling, but let's let's bring let's bring a style that's different what from what it was now. Maybe not much in the hardcore department, but in the serious de wrestling department." Which is, I find I find that particular thing interesting in the context of the matter because. Let's let's think it. Let's because the whole thing started. I think the I think the year started was two thousand two. Two thousand two, same as TNA actually. And let's consider let's consider the re the wrestling landscape in North America in two thousand two. Yeah, and by the way, I should probably put a disclaimer. I have good knowledge of Ring of Honor, but I'm no by by no means an expert. I am simply representing the wrestling department of uh, the monastery in this particular situation. Yeah. I, and You'll know enough to give you a, a, a primer, and if you wish to watch it, I do know Honor Club is still there, and they have a deep library. I'd I'd say right now they have the most valuable library in in North America, and you're going to see a a bit a bidding war in the years to come. Mm hmm. But but it is still there. You can still subscribe it mm -hmm. to it, and for however long it may last you, you have access to a lot of Ring of Honor. Yeah. Now. <clears throat> 2001 is widely is widely considered by a lot of people to be the best year that the WWF had especially especially in that especially in that post Monday Night Wars um, setup and it was cer it was certainly the best year that Triple H has ever had in his career and, and crazy he, and he only had five months in that year mm -hmm. that's how crazy a year that was uh, like if you go from WrestleMania 2000 uh, WrestleMania 16 to X7 or 17 
he had one of one of the best years in professional wrestling. Period. Mm-hmm. Uh, but WWF was had the hot hand. R- Rumble, uh, no way out to WrestleMania, and e- even you could say uh, the, the even if the, the 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 rest of the shows were had varying levels of success that weren't up to the hype that that was brought from the first four months of of the year. You had an invasion to it. They had they two thousand one was a was a good year. It was a all in all, they still had a great year. Mm-hmm. However, that being however, with the with the departure of WCW and ECW, that left significant voids for people who wanted that particular style, who weren't in, who weren't interested in the sports entertainment style of things. And there were a lot. There were a fair few feds that that propped up in the in the wake of ECW's demise. But a lot of them focused a lot more on the hardcore end of things. And XPW is a big example of that. And uh, just watch Dark Side of the Ring. It's a thing. Yeah, the other one. The other one that I'd say had I say was able to maintain itself better. Um, was CZW, although the first few years for CZW were rough, largely because um, <sighs> I'm not entirely I'm not entirely sure if Zandig was very good as a booker. <laughs> I've I've heard varying various reviews, and yeah, the consensus was he had he had the right idea, just the wrong kind of execution. And then there was that there the, there's that infamous night where. Oh, they had a, let's have a deathmatch tournament into the night w- with no fucking lights. Uh, dear fans, please bring your cars to the ring. Repeat, please bring your cars to the ring. Leave your headlights on. We'll pay for the gas. They did not pay for the gas. <laughs> yeah. I'm, o- I'm only joking in this particular case, but yeah. No. Whereas, whereas as, as I understand, as I've understood it, and I think I think Samoa Joe had brought this up in a, in a shoot interview, but the big inspiration that they had was all was all Japan re- was all Japan pro wrestling, the the King's Road style that that was being presented there. Yeah, and wanted essentially wanting to take a wanting to take a bunch of independent talent and integrate it with the, with that particular style. I guess to I, guess. I mean, you can tell with, with some of the the guest the guest stars they would get in in the early run of, of the company. Uh, Kento Kobashi for for what for one example. And to be fair, it's it is understand it is understandable. I I know some people who are just getting into Japanese wrestling might have asked why they, why they didn't try and get a get a relationship with New Japan. Um, they would eventually, but at first the influencers were all Japan and pro wrestling. Noah, I'd say I'd say the first and then the second, but New Japan in the early two thousands, which is something we I don't want to belabor too much on, was not in a very good place. In fact, they were in a very bad, bad place. And if all Japan want- and Noah were the were were the top companies uh, during that time. Yeah. Long story short, Inoki fucked up. There's and that's a short, short version. Not even the, it's not even the most accurate ver- version. There were videos on this. Mm-hmm. Uh, one in particular called uh, by uh, by someone called Kim Justice. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, it's not available because Japan and copyright uh, are uh, are bitches and dicks. But Antonio, I'll. I'll do a, I'll do a brief summary on this. Antonio Inoki is ha, has a bit has a big chub for um for combat sports and his strong style was a reflection of that. But he wanted to go even further by integrating M- the burgeoning MMA scene with wrestling. It didn't work at all. And resulted and resulted in things like things like Brock Lesnar's New Japan run or um or Rob or Rob or Rob or uh, Sap being Bob Sap Bob, Bob Sap Bob Sap being arguably the worst IWGP heavyweight champion in history. It did. It did. 
have some side effect success. I mean, Katsuhiro Shibata did leave for a while, but the influences on his uh, on his later career uh, and his, starting with his uh, New Japan comeback are you could tell that it helped. Yeah, but the but the fact of the matter is that 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 was the approach that they wanted to do, which started with the show known as an era of honor begins and of co- of course a l- of course a lot of names that would become mainstays started to make their appear started to make their appearance i'd s- and i'd say i'd say in that first generation there were there were um four, there was a kind of big four a kind of four pillars set up Iro- ironic can you when you consider that um, the four pillars of heaven, and of course, if you want to think of think of the present, uh, the present uh, company here, uh, yeah, the four pillars of AEW. But that's another story. Yeah, but I'd say th- I'd say those four, and it's interesting where some of their careers have gone versus others, were Christopher Daniels, mm-hmm. uh, who wh- who jumped right in when it came to his fallen angel g- gimmick around. Around this time, I'd say I'd say that's his I'd say that's his oldest incarnation. Um, yeah, low key, who is really good, but and but has a tendency to piss people off. I don't have a voice though. Yeah, I, I'm honestly I'm honestly surprised low key has never gotten voice acting roles to my knowledge. It's shocking, but another story for another yeah. day. Um, CM Punk. Who needs no? Who needs no introduction? You do not need an introduction on CM motherfucking punk. And the person who was the flag bearer, Samoa Joe. And I say I say that because Samoa Joe in those early days, especially with especially with the record setting run that he that he had for thing thing was like what four hundred days, four hundred or so days. That's around that time, yeah, folks. You know his early run in DNA? That was the end of this prime, of prime Ring of Honor, Joe. Yeah. You have no idea how good he was in Ring of Honor. But no. in in a weird way, I liken, the, I liken um, that, that Ring of Honor champion, Joe, Joe to NWA era Ric Flair, or just the, just the NWA champion in general during the territory days, because... Not only was he frequently defending the belt on on Ring of Honor shows, but he would go to other shows and defend the belt, much yeah. the same way that Ric Flair would defend would defend the NWA Championship against the whoever was the top guy for various promotions. And that of course that of course en- ended up getting a lot of eyes, which I'd say helped open the way to the first collaboration they had with all with all Japan. And Specifically, him do, him having a match with Kenta Kabashi, whose Joe's Joe's wrestling style is as had some common ground between him and um and and the and the Emerald Man himself, Mitsuharu Misawa, mm-hmm. which that's another match you, you folks need to watch. But what I I do remember when he when he did a sh- when Joe did a shoot interview on it on. It, on Steve Austin's podcast, and he brought up how he had he had to essentially talk Kobashi with it, with his limited conversational Japanese into into understanding that he's that he's not working heel for this because he he thought, he thought <laughs> Kobashi was coming in thinking that he was going to be playing the evil foreigner foreigner, and Joe had to keep tell had to keep telling him over and over, no, you're. You're not do- you're not doing that. Everybody up. Everybody in that crowd knows you are. They've been do- they've been tape trading y- your matches for years. You're g- you're going to be babyface, and I'm and I'm going to do my. He had a little bit of he had a little bit of shell shock when he heard that pop. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, I think I think because he, I think because it didn't quite set in until until he heard that pop, and um, the other th- the other thing that's I'd I'd say is I'd say um ROH is. More or less, the only promotion that really do- that really does this in in the states, and I wish more promotions would do it, is one of my favorite parts of en- of any opening to a match, and that is the streamers. 
yeah, Ring of Honor brought that shit into the states, folks. Uh, that's a that's a clearly a, a, an old school Japanese tradition. I don't think it's done in most places anymore that I maybe know know in all of Japan, but um, it's not done in New Japan. No, probably probably because it'd be kind of hard to do that in the Tokyo Dome. <laughs> um, yep. But the but. I do, I do think it's still I do think it's still done in all Japan. I do think it's still done in Noah. I don't know I don't know if it's I don't know if it's done all that much in Dragon Gate. Um and I wouldn't be surprised if it was still done in in um some of the smaller promotions like Re, like Re, like Wrestle 1. Large or uh, or zero or zero one at some, at some point. Um of course, some I think some of them are some of them also do the the flower presentation before championship matches as well. Uh, but it's all but it's always it's always an awesome sight. Although um, although one of our fa one of our boys had some fun with it when he became the streamer monster for a few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Steen. Oh, we'll get to him, folks. Yeah. Don't worry. But while there while there were other, while there obviously were other champ champions in in between in between that in those early days, the um I'd I'd say I'd I'd say the I'd say there were two real there were two real events that helped Ring of Honor come out of come out of its mat come out of its match obsessed shell. One of them being the interpromotional battle between themselves and CZW. Which ha which had a brief appearance by Jim Cornette. We'll get to him later. But the other actually, his presence and nephew was actually a good thing for Bring of Honor at the time. Yeah, but the other one that I think I think is worth getting into is the is the long long feud that CM Punk had with Raven. Out. That is, yeah. You, you, I think you have a better uh, grasp on that particular feud. Yeah, they, uh, they ended. It was, it was, it was a case of, it was a case of long form storytelling and full, and a full on, a full on rivalry between the two. And obviously, the, I think, I think both Punk and Raven were given, F, were given a fair amount of leeway in how, in how that was handled. Um. Of course, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up how the sum the um, summer of punk that people thought they saw in Junior Land is paling in comparison to the summer of punk yeah. as it was in Ring of Honor. It pales in comparison because the the way in Ring of Honor, folks, punk didn't do that for the babyface pops. He did that. The he okay. It had become common knowledge that CM Punk was about to wrap things up in Ring of Honor to go to WWE. He, like, because at the time that was the thing to do. You work your way in the Indies, you get noticed. They send you a big contract with a big a bunch of zeros as a downside guarantee. You sign it, you're good. Mm -hmm. It was the style at, t at the time. Mm -hmm. But Punk had a few dates and said, well, Contract doesn't go into effect until I wrap up with Ring of Honor. Let's play around with it. And Punk, at, at the time, partly thanks to his feud with Raven, actually, decided, not only am I going to go on a on a on a false run, let's leak the idea the idea that I'm leaving for the Fed, which was seated in, in truth. And one of my last matches will be for the Ring of Honor World Title. I will win it. And in the next show, show up in a suit and sign my WWE contract on the Ring of Honor World Championship. Mm -hmm. He did, and he did, and he got some motherfucking heat. Yeah. And incident, incident, inc and of of, of course, start, of course, this all this also helps start his burgeoning relationship that he continues to this day with Living Color. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'd because which is certainly a step up from you from using Miseria Cantor from AFI. 
the Derek on Tare, which it, look, there are going to be some people who, who are going to, yeah, they're going to listen to this, listen to what you just said and go, boo. But look at the same time, I'm not going to shit on that opinion either. It's more, it's more to do with the, if I'm be if I'm being honest, if, if I associate any wrestler with AFI as an entrance, um, more often than not, I'm going to associate Jimmy Havoc. I think he got more out of um, AFI out of AFI than Paul yeah, did. which is fair. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the, the the so yeah, so Summer of Punk, he he loses the belt. His last match is against Colt Cabana, which that's a history in its own right. The the one of the highlights of that original era. There's two guys that we need to bring up: mm-hmm. a Nigel McGuinness. He was hot shit in Ring of Honor. Mm-hmm. And Brian Danielson. I'd say- A lot of the shit that we mark out doing like the high after the five, the the the, the competition driven, gold driven madman that we see today, a lot of it's infl- is old school Daniel Bryan or old school Brian Danielson. I would say that the, I would say that there are three in, there are three individuals who composed what could be considered the second generation or for lack of a better term, the new generation. Boo! <laughs> yeah, that's a boo. That I deserve. I'm not going to do the whole the whole boo shtick, but I'm still going to boo you. Yeah. Um, those were Nigel McGinnis, who, yep. in- incidentally, if you've listened, if you've listened to Heavy Gretel, um, let me ruin that song for everybody by t- by telling you, you do realize this is j- this is this is this is all that is all about banging a fat chick, right? Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah. Um, Brian Danielson was as well, as well, and mm-hmm. um, a and a young Austin Aries. Um, young and unfucked with, not cancer like yet. Yeah. Though he had that reputation, but it was not cancerous yet. It was not. Uh, well, we had we had a bunch of football fans here. Not Le'Veon Bell, Antonio Brown ish yet. Mm-hmm. Whereas McGin, whereas McGinnis, he he's he's done well, but just had a but just had a run of bad luck. Um, yeah, a lot of it came from his uh, time from his time in TNA, and mm-hmm. well, that again, that's another story, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but uh, I'll, I'm just going to emphasize this first era, for the first generation, the, the pre HD net era, mm-hmm. is what it is called. You hear a lot of names: CM Punk, Dan Bri- Brian Danielson, Samoa Joe, CM Punk. A lot of names. Some of them went to the Fed. Christopher Daniels, Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, who didn't who wrestled for a cup of coffee in Ring of Honor. He didn't have a, 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 as prominent. A role in Ring of Honor, but he was still in there for a cup of coffee. Mm-hmm. Those three, those last three guys in TNA, pretty much anchored the X division. CM Punk, well, we all know what he did eventually, of course. Yeah. Uh, Brian Danielson, he he had just he was kind of the bridge from the old from the Fritz era to the HD Net era, which which is how I started watching Ring of Honor, ironically enough. There's one avenue we have to talk about when it comes to that second generation. And that was the introduction of something that was a staple for a few years, then it wasn't talk- then it wasn't talked about for for years and years until until last year when they brought it back. And that is the pure championship and the pure rules. Long story short, folks. Mm-hmm. This is pro wrestling if if pro wrestling was still a shoot with some MMA influence on the rules, long story short, standard pro wrestling rules, except rope breaks. You only get three of them. Uh, the open hand slap, the, the, the rules about open hand slaps and open hand slaps against uh, punches, DQ count outs, all that stuff. They are strictly enforced. You throw a punch, it costs you a rope break. And if you lose all your, if you throw a punch after you throw all for all your rope breaks, it's an automatic DQ. That kind of stuff. Long story short, the idea was to keep it as pure as possible. Mm-hmm. You know, the wrestling is kept in the ring, the rope breaks, 
throw in a, a rule as in, a rule as in kind of like the timeouts in football in a sense. Mm-hmm. And the idea was again, keep it in the ring, no shenanigans. If pro wrestling from the uh, from the old era, the the shoot era before the golden uh, the uh, gold dust trio. Mm-hmm. Uh, if that's a long story short, there's a Adam Blompier did a thing on Toots Mont that, that explains why we call it the, the, the gold dust trio. Mm-hmm. Long story short, pro wrestling as it is today, that's the trio we're talking about. There, and that's the influence they have. Mm-hmm. Back to the back to the pure rules. Basically, before that, that was wrestling was strictly regimented. You had time limits, but uh, it was it, but it was. Purely Greco-Roman, but for cash stakes and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then they started putting in time limits and all that stuff. Long story short, pro wrestling, it's kind of a fusion of both, like the of the uh, whiz bam pow wrestling that we know and love, and the old school rules, Mm -hmm. as if you would have uh, a more sports like presentation. Yeah. Now it went away after uh, Danielson and and. I want to remember. I want to get my facts straight on this one. It was Danielson and Nigel McGuinness who unified the belts, mm-hmm. and then it went the way of the low lay, lay of the land and Ring of Honor as we knew it, as we knew it for the longest time. Was just that we would have the world title, the tag team titles, and uh, they would eventually throw in the TV title mm-hmm. uh, mid uh, mid HD net era. Actually, uh, in response to the HD net era, they introduced the television championship and it just evolved from there mm-hmm. why it came back uh simple pandemic they needed that the ring of honor needed a gimmick other than we are wrestling yeah and the pure the bringing back of the pure championship that was uh marty's one of marty's girls big big ideas and one will must give full credit because it was a goddamn genius one at that. Mm-hmm. And this was before the pandemic happened. They were thinking of bringing it back before the pandemic. The pandemic was pretty much it was for for it was perceived as a saving grace in a sense, mm-hmm. a way to give you to get you involved in the action. And it really was in the graphical presentation, mm-hmm. the pure championship. Before the HD net era, you didn't have any graphics. You had to keep track on your own mind, like the crowd and like the people in the crowd. And of course, the announcer would announce if you if they've run out of rope breaks, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Pure title, sixty minute time, and all that stuff. And then you would throw the the you would see the uh, the graphics where you see the the three bars representing the three rope breaks, the overall uh, presentation. You know the the extra cameras. They would have the boom camera, like the, the camera on a crane. Uh, would would show off a little bit more. It became like the sports like presentation that Ring of Honor always had. It was just they didn't have the the, the budget to, to throw in uh, the extra bells and whistles that they have now. It gave them something to watch, and the pure the pure tournament was a uh, something to watch in twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. Now, incidentally, I while some people while some people might debate on this, I do think somewhat. I do think someone else who who would kind of fit into that second generation is Chris Hero. Yeah, yeah, he and Claudio Castagnoli uh, come in, came into prominence during the HD Net era as the kings of wrestling, the KOW kings of wrestling. Mm-hmm. But he came in on the cusp as part of the second generation. So yeah. there's a debate. I'm not going to jump into it. He just came in. In it, 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 like just before the end of and the beginning of another. So, if you want to debate it, I'll leave you to it. At this yeah. point, Chris Hero was part of Ring of Honor. That cannot be denied. Yeah, and he's he's another who was he was another who came, who was also spending time in IWA Mid South, which had bet which had better names than it deserved. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Hey, sometimes you run it you, that you luck your way into a good talent pool. It happens. But when it comes to when it come, but when it comes to the eight when it comes to what we refer to as the HD Net era, HD Net was was one of the, was um a very a very small time channel and very hard very hard to get, but it was television. It was television and Ring of Honor. What it, the the evolution of Ring of Honor as far as the mainstream the quote mainstream accessibility to it 
was very slow. It was always uh, like a tape traders, DVD traders. If they, if they were in town, that was the that was the hot ticket. If you're a wrestling fan, kind of a show. The advent of HDNet gave them that exposure. It, it, as limited as it was, HDNet had that exposure. And at the time, uh, we had satellite th- through Bell, mm-hmm. uh, at least at my place, and we had HDNet. And it was just, I think it was like four or five episodes in. This was in the tail end of uh, Brian Danielson's run at, in Ring of Honor. And they just were plugging the final countdown tour. Mm-hmm. Austin Aries was into his second run as, as Ring of Honor World Champion. And Kevin Steen was there. And that just put a smile on my face. Mm-hmm. We'll get to him because he had a, in the tail end of the HD net era, uh, he had a big role to play there. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the HDNet era, this was ar- around this around this time. Um, Gabe Sapolsky was kind was kind of winding down. He clearly wanted out. He wanted out. Wanted to go start a new, start a, something new, or just sub, start something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, he would eventually start Evolve, which is just you know, Ring of Honor, but in in in. in uh, but is in more of his vision, in a sense, like it was. Uh, they like basically uh, what AEW would do with the uh, win and, wins and loss records mm-hmm. at first. That's and of course, it, it evolved was more Ring of Honor, but uh, centric toward. Well, it was another kind of Ring of Honor in that in that sense, but without the the shaking the fans and uh, it was the evolution of wrestling. I don't know too much on uh, the history of Evolve, unfortunately, to give you a, a proper uh, primer on, on on Evolve Wrestling, but it was, in a sense, another Gabe Sapolsky, hey, let's start the Ring of Honor without the Ring of Honor kind of mm-hmm. stuff. It is, although when it comes to Gabe, I will always laugh about his infamous temper tantrums. Yeah, that that's probably what caused the, the split with them, between him and Ring of Honor. Though, I'm, all, I'm purely speculating, of course. Well... I wonder. I, I wonder if he's still. I wonder if he's still mad about the time CM Punk crank called him. <laughs> Two bucks says there's salt left in that mine. <laughs> well, spe- especially when you have somebody when you when you keep somebody when you keep somebody going and almost give him a heart almost give him a heart attack because there was the thought that homicide was gonna can- was going to cancel the All Japan show. Oh yeah, that uh, the yeah. <laughs> well, the, whole, the whole thing started was because apparently CM Punk does a good homicide impression. Oh, can can neither confirm nor deny. Yeah, I um I have the I still have the DVD of um the shoot interview that Punk and Joe did, and it is an absolute is an absolute tr- is an absolute tr- treat with the amount of chemistry that those two have in that in that in that whole thing. And you, I end up learning two things about homicide. One, um, <laughs> do not go drink. Do not go drinking with him. Nope. And two, um, do do not do not under en- under any circum any circumstances go to uh, go to t- go to Taco Bell with him. <laughs> We ain't telling that those stories, folks. You <laughs> seek those stories out. Yeah. Uh, but the th- but more but more on po- more on point. Um, around the around this time, this was when um, Jim Cornette started to make hit make yeah. more make more of an appearance as as he, a character from a behind the scenes yeah from a behind the scenes uh, thing his original uh, influence was more of a, uh, a consultant slash figurehead uh during the ring of honor czw uh, uh mega feud in this era corny was still a a, a, a on screen figurehead but he had become the, an executive producer with uh, HDNet. He uh, he had more influence. He basically became the booker mm-hmm. for 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 better or worse. This caused a few rifts. Uh, this I believe was 2020, uh, 2011, So oh my god, over already ten years ahead. He um, 
he had a few likes and dislikes on, on people. He liked El Generico. He did not like Kevin Steen as one example, which kind of led it to ironically one of their best feuds in the, in the early to uh, early 2010s. Uh, he liked Davy Richards. He he liked he liked the guys who who had that technical style. Maybe not uh, true Southern, but enough of the grounded. He he was not big into flips. the The way that the way that, the way that I've I've seen it. Yes, he did. He was responsible for give, for giving the promotion a few more a few more years, and would eventually yeah. um would eventually spearhead the the deal with Sinclair. But in in both in both OVW, in TNA, and in, and in Ring of Honor, and I'd say, I'd say in other places as well, his mindset yeah. has been to try and do um, old school old school territorial techniques with with modern guys, which which is, I there's mean, there's certainly some ben- there's certainly some benefits to that in terms of, in terms of um, storytelling. But what I think, but I you're think gonna rub, he, you're gonna rub a lot of people the wrong way. His influence on what Ring of Honor became cannot be undervalued, though, because as you said, he helped spear, spearhead the deal to get out of the DHG net deal and, and get into a purchase with Sinclair uh, Broadcasting. He had he had an influence. I'm not gonna I'm not going to do debate the the the, the percentage, but he was involved. At the same time, his idea of old school with uh, old school techniques with new school. Not everyone does that. that not was, everyone does the new school. That the big the big problem was the reason why I think the reason why this was able to work in something like um, Smoky Mountain or OVW is because of the is because of the fact that with the, with those he was able to. Have a, have a bit more control on the style of wrestlers that he that he was working with. Whereas part of the appeal with with Ring of Honor was that was this was always this hybridization between American style wrestling and Japanese or Japanese and Mexican styles and your and it was European styles. That it, it, it there's a reason why we 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 coined the term super indie with with, uh, with Ring of Honor. It always took pride in signing people, but always let people uh, do their indie dates whenever they were taping or doing a big thing. As long as you weren't double booked, uh, if you didn't, the idea was any any booking that wasn't a Ring of Honor date, you're good. Long story short, there was a lot of styles, and Jim had a specific style where he he would let certain styles work as he understood the variety part, but he only paid lip service. From what I remember to it, like you can tell there were some guys that could do more than just what was presented on TV every week. Mm-hmm. Again, we go back to, to what he liked and what he didn't like. And what he didn't like was the way uh, shoot. There was a shoot reason why Kevin Steen wasn't around Ring of Honor too much until uh, very, very until it became Ring of Honor champion. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And if if you look at if you look at the 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 kind of the kind of guys that he was definitely fav, definitely favoring were were guys were guys like um, Roderick Strong, Davey Rich, Robbie Strong, Davy Richards, mm-hmm. Eddie Edwards. Yeah, the, the 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 American Wolves were a big tag team during that era, mm-hmm. and it's not that we're not gonna I'm not gonna knock on, on that because they were a great fucking tag team. Mm-hmm. And so were the Briscoes, and they, they they had influence in there as well. Yeah. However, however, the the issue the issue stem the issue stems from the fact that what people li- what people like about what people like about Ring of Honor, and what pe- and what people um and and what a t- what a territory guy would want would want to see reflected did not. It did not exactly work, and I think I think in Jim's case it was an inability to read the room. Yeah, because so I do so know. a classic example that I love to bring up: mm-hmm. Davy Richards at the anniversary show and at the Hammerstein Ballroom. 
big main event. Kevin Steen. Nowhere to be found on the card or somewhere not around. I believe what had happened was uh, my, my my timing, my history is off on that one. He had either been fired or just was part of the roster, but Cornette was obviously intent on not keeping him on, on the TV as much as much as possible because Cornette does not like Steam. Mm-hmm. So there, if you're wondering why I have, been, uh, I have uh, why I do not like, uh, why I used to like Jim Cornette, but not anymore. That's one of the big reasons there. Big thing, it's a big thing. Uh, Davy Richards, he wins. It's a big deal. All of a sudden, Chris, uh, not Chris Jarrett, but all of a sudden, <laughs> Kevin Steen got, you hear Kevin Steen, whoa, hey, 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 hey. And he obviously says that he starts cutting a promo, says, hey, congratulations, big anniversary show. Why the fuck was I not, well, not, not on your basic Kevin Steen promo, which is always fucking awesome, by the way. Yeah. And, and then he goes, happy anniversary, Davey, you jujitsu jack off. <laughs> oh, hey, hey, hey. And, and in response to uh, the rock on trending worldwide on a uh, pussyfoot bitch or something like that, Steen comes up. Oh, hey, hey, by the way, jujitsu, jujitsu jack off trending worldwide. <laughs> and but the but throughout the throughout that particular feud, there there was there was this there and it, it, admittedly this was something that was played up this idea yeah. of Davy Richards is the is the clean cut guy that ma- that management wants as champion whereas the anti authority Kevin Steen character was the was um was the one that the, the one that the fans want and who no, was but he, and you know the crazy guy. part the lead up to Davy Richards' run as Ring of Honor champion, there was hype. There were people who the, people were happy for Davy. He had earned it. It's not just management in this case. Did, although in this case, that part was played up a little bit more after the fact. But before the fact, Davy Davy earned his Ring of Honor championship. But at least in storyline, earned it. This was honestly earned. But the idea behind, but eventually, Kevin Steen would had become undeniable that even the fans turned on Davy. Would you say that Davy Richards, in this regard, was the was the ring of, was the Ring of Honor version of Lex Luger? That's too harsh. Yeah, that that's too harsh for Ring of Honor. That I uh, no, this was a case of. It had become Davy. Davy was always the fighting champion, so you couldn't. And people again, people liked Davy. Davy earned the respect of, of the crowd, respect of the peers, respect of management. He earned it. It was just a, the idea of Steen and 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 Cornette was just a little too a little stronger, or had become a little too strong. Yeah. And of course, of course, with of course with with um. I'd I'd also be remiss if we didn't if we didn't mention the early days of the of the television title, and which which was something that was going to be inevitable because while you can while you can you can do with you don't necessarily need a B, a um a secondary t- a secondary singles title when you're when you're work when you're um just doing large shows and not doing tel- not doing weekly sh- weekly uh, affairs. But I think when you're doing a week, when you're doing a weekly show, you do you do kind of need that because you can't have you can't have your big your big feuds all you can't have all your big feuds just on, just on the uh, world championship on its own. No, and a lot of feuds uh, were started or were revolved around the, uh, the world television championship. Mm-hmm. Uh, some That's, of the early champions, El Generico, Roderick Strong was the, I believe, the inaugural champion. No, hmm. I believe it was David Richards. Let me do my googling here. Yeah. Although, I, although I will, I will say that that particular, um, I was, not, I will freely admit that the t- the um, the title des- the title designs at the at this particular point in time. I was not a fan of the te- of the television title design. 
I yeah, the first one was very very blue. It was very blue, blue and, and very crowded. There we go. First champion was Eddie Edwards. So there we go. Eddie Edwards, Christopher Daniels, El Generico, Jay Lethal, Roderick Strong was its fifth champion, and of course Adam Cole. Bye bye. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, Jay Lethal, his television championship uh, led him to the world championship eventually. Yeah, he had. Be, uh, no, I, uh, though I believe it was his second run. Mm-hmm. Though is, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Jay Lethal's first run with the TV title. I'd I'd say I'd say it was one I'd say it was one of the major things that helped re, that helped reestablish him because he had already, yeah because this was after his um his run this was TNA. after White Machismo run with Impact slash TNA wrestling so he needed he was in kind of a need of a career revival yeah and of course now granted Jay Lethal was did did start his early days in Ring of Honor as Hydro but. He, but he was ju- he was just a gr- he was just a um, green boy under Samoa Joe's tutelage at the time. Yeah, he t- he, oh, so he really gained cool. a lot of experience and notoriety in TNA before returning to Ring of Honor and it, to basically run out of he basically ran his entire career. Uh, a lot of his prime was in Ring of Honor when you think about it. Mm-hmm. Now, when it come when it came to, but when it came to Getting back to that whole reading the room thing, I do th- I do think that applying some old school te- some old school um, techniques can can be done can be done with a modern um, a modern wrestling roster. I'll give but, you the, bo- the the most ironic example of that, but I'll let you finish first. I'm sorry. But if you're going to do that, you have to understand what you actually what you actually have on your palate. And what's go- what's going to work and what isn't, and what styles you need to, what styles you need to integrate into that, so you don't have and round pegs and square holes. I'll give Ring of Honor and Jim Cornette all the credit in the world for reading the room when it came to Kevin Steen and El Generico. Mm-hmm. That feud is still one of my favorite feuds of all time because a lot of old school tactics were were used, long term booking for one thing. Mm-hmm. The idea of the the false finish and the heel always getting away to, to give uh, more and more heat on on the situation. Long story short, a long term feud that lasted a year mm-hmm. in that era in 2010, 2020, uh, 2010, 2011 was, if not unheard of, very rare. And one that la- that was as effective as it was, because not only did was it just Steen versus Generico? It was Steen. You had a Cold Cabana, uh, the Princess. Yeah, the zo- the zombie pr- the zombie the zombie princess. princess. And I keep fucking forgetting the name now. Fuck. I have anyway. To... Yeah, the people who the people who would be would be cornerstones in um. In the creation of scum, basically, Steve Carino. Mm-hmm. Ah, help me, Monk! Don't leave me hanging. Jimmy Jacobs. Thank you. <laughs> that was gonna kill me uh, the entire night. But yeah, Jimmy Jacobs, Steve Carino, and uh, and of course my boy Kevin Steen. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had, I believe, this was before or after his run. He had two runs with the Ring of Honor t- title, actually, but I can't. Put my finger on it. This is why. This is why I say don't trust me on the history of it. But yeah. uh, and while there ha- while there had been there had been sta- there had been stables in one form or another throughout the years, I look at Scum as the fir- as as one of the earliest examples of Ring of Honor trying to do a full on heel stable. There, yeah. And I know I know some I do remember some I do remember some people say. If there if there's any negative I could say about Scum, it was a bit of a bit of poor timing because I think people were sick of the the evil stable after TNA had basically had basically done it like three times in the in the in the span of half a decade because because remember they they um they did there was the, there was the main event Mafia. 
Mm -hmm. Then there, then there was, um, then there was Immortal, and th and then there, and then there was um, Aces and Eights. All right, so here's what happened: the feud was between 2010 and 2011. Mm -hmm. The Kevin Steen run after he uh, interrupted Davy Richards was after he was reinstated, technically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he, went, he would go until he would lose to Jay Briscoe in 2013. And by the time 2014 happened, uh, well, he, he was still a singles guy, still very popular, but he left. Yeah. But, it, but he, in, the, in the interim, after, when, when the shift... And the shift started to happen between between um moving moving away from HDNet and moving on to um, Sinclair, which in my which in my case was the CW at il at um eleven thirty on Saturday nights, not the best. Yeah, thing, that's the unfortunately best. they was uh, they owned Ring of Honor, but they didn't want to bother promoting it other than just it was a syndicated program, which eh, that that. Your your results may vary, unfortunately, on this particular case. But it was both a good thing and a bad thing. If if you if you want to yeah. deal with that, the bad the bad part of it is the fact that Sinclair does not like to spend money. No. Also, best in the world twenty eleven was the uh, the show it was not an anniversary. Oh, it was an anniversary show. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, it probably was. You know what? It probably was a defense. Not that I think about it, but yeah. But um, but in in that t in that title reign, you all, you had the whole thing with basically I think all of the ch all of the championship titles that they had at the time got a got a revamp, and uh, it was uh, Reggie Parks and a few other people made those belts, and the revamp the the revamped belts like I have you and I both have the same replica of the world title. Mm -hmm. My favorite design and one that I regret getting it as a replica was a TV title at the time. Mm -hmm. And people would say, well, it's not the prettiest, it's not the best, but I'm like, dude, a lot of people wore that championship, and I, 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 I have fond remembrances of that design. Yeah. And truth be, t truth be told, that sort of vertical design is not one you see, you saw all that often <clears throat> back then, and even now. A lot of a lot of belt designs over over the years, going going all the way back to the going all the way back to the '60s, are designed vertic are designed um horizontally, not vertically. Yeah, the 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 the, the standard thing would be it's a horizontal horizontal center plate, maybe a little bit of height depending on the championship design. The the, the classic example is the big gold, mm -hmm. very wide but tall at the same time to represent girth and and. Uh, and uh, Prestige and giganticness, uh, for 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 lack of better per, uh, for uh, lack of a better uh, situation, so to speak. And I'd say the the only the only belt I could I could think of that had a ver that had a vertical design before that, and I'm pretty sure there's some indie ones that I'm overlooking. But the the one that comes to mind, it, there's two that come to mind. One was the um, was was the championship belt from from uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling? The other was the sit was the brief attempt at a six man belt in in WCW. WCW yeah. Which, if you look at the WCW six man titles, you see where the influence was for the Ring of Honor TV title. Actually, mm -hmm. not a complete copy, but you could see the influence at least in the center plate as well. Yeah. Um, but this is where at the time I love the TV title because yeah. you you would have guys like you know you'd have Adam Cole, Matt Taven, uh, Jay Lethal, Tommaso Ciampa, Roderick Strong, Tomohiro Ishii. Mm -hmm. Now, if you wonder why I want a replica of that belt, there there's there's a nostalgic reason for it. One of the big reasons why I bought a Ring of Honor pay per view at the time using actually. If I remember correctly, it was using the PlayStation Network at the time. This was PS3 era, or the end of the PS3 era, actually. Mm -hmm. The match advertised was Tomohiro Ishii versus Bobby Fish at Global Wars in Chicago. Mm -hmm. That got a that match got me a got a pay per view by anime. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
and that's that is something that we sh that is something we should we should go into because um yeah with, with with the with the uh, purchase of Sinclair uh a lot of shit happened of course yeah. the HD Nan arrow had gave him some popularity but mm -hmm. no more popularity was gained when New Japan got involved again we talked about the all Japan pro wrestling no influence mm -hmm. In the in the meantime, we just, two guys in in New Japan decided, you know what? Fuck it, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna rebuild New Japan. Obviously, Gato got the book that there was a lot of changes in ownership, hmm. and uh, it helps that a particular ace called Hiroshi Tanahashi basically resurrected New New Japan to the company that we know today. By and large, obviously, that the pandemic did them in a little bit as well. But the before before the hit the shit hit the fan, they were the hottest promotion. Yeah, and New Japan, New Japan, and I'd say a lot. I'd say a lot of Japanese promotions have always always had a bit of a thing of having working relationships with with other promotions. A lot of it has to do with their, with the training in New and New Japan in particular. Uh, their young lines, after graduating from the program, would be sent in excursion in order to just broaden their horizons, get some experience, get some matches under the belt, and in certain cases, especially in Mexico, get some character. Uh, you would have uh, guys like uh, 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 Tetsuya Naito, uh, Hiromu Takahashi are two classic examples in New Japan. Uh, at least in Mexico, Shinsuke Nakamura as well. Shinsuke Nakamura is the, the bigger one. I, I did didn't want to say because I wasn't sure, but yeah, Shinsuke Nakamura, the biggest influence he got was wrestling in Japan. Uh, not not in Japan, but in, in Mexico. Yeah. Um, the idea extended to the U U.S. and Ring of Honor. Pretty much went okay. Long story short, Japan, New Japan had a uh, had a. Uh, a uh, relationship with TNA, it did not go well, but it gave him uh, Kazuchika Okada and that experience to go, okay, I need a character here. Yeah, so if there was one good thing about that uh, relationship other than lip service out of TNA, that's what it was. I ended up learning two things about that re regarding um, regarding Okada's take on his, on his run at the time. Um, one of them is the fact that because of the fact that he had that he had fuck all to do for long amounts of time, he would spend oh, his yeah. off time watching tapes. Two, <clears throat> he's credited Sting with helping him come up with the Rainmaker gimmick. Which, if that's true, Sting gets a big dub on that. Mm -hmm. Three, you know how the you know how for the last several years there's been that tradition of the winner of the G, of the G one climax tournament. Is carrying around a briefcase that is their that is their guaranteed ticket. But if they lose a if they lose a match before the Tokyo Dome, they lose that they lose that briefcase. Yeah. Um. Apparently that apparently that was Okada's idea, and it was him taking a taking a shot taking direct shots at the Money in the Bank briefcase and the Feaster Fired briefcase. Because he didn't, he didn't care for this idea of somebody winning the, of somebody winning that briefcase, and then go on a losing streak before they cash it in. Yeah, but the, we're not gonna. I'm, I don't want to dwell on, on the TNA thing too much here. Long story short, the that deal it also involved uh, Kurt, Kurt Angle with the idea with the uh, I think it was the Russell one Inoki's championship, yeah, which was the IWGP championship. It's a clusterfuck. Mm -hmm. Well, let's put it this way. Brock Les we have to go back to the Brock Lesnar days. But basically the way they handled the the, the talent, including uh Naito and uh Okada, like they wanted some exposure, not to be looked ridiculous, which, you know, sorry. That got split and New Japan started looking for a new guy for a new company and Ring of Honor got involved. Mm -hmm. Uh there, there's this, this this goes deeper and deeper and deeper, but long story short, they got together and Right around the same time, a particular uh, faction started to get a lot of steam. Uh, by, by the way, Monk, I don't know about you, but my hand is cramping in a too sweet motion. I don't know about you. <laughs> yes. Uh, it is the 
what I find what I find kind of funny is that Bullet Club had already had already had already been around for a had already been around for a bit. Yeah, the, 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 this we're talking about. Uh, we're talking more of the AJ Styles era mm-hmm. and, and on, but they uh, they were the, the relationship was started with that, and a lot of it from 2013, 2014 with the World of the Worlds pay per views. Mm-hmm. Uh, you would see guys, you would see AJ Styles, Gallows and Anderson, and the Young Bucks, and Young Bucks started to wrestle for the Ring of Honor. So the minute they became Biz Cliz, uh they pretty much went buck wild on the gimmick. And at first it wasn't a big deal, but it, the Bullet Club boy had started gaining, gaining steam at, steam in Ring of Honor, mostly thanks to the Young Bucks, of course. Mm-hmm. Ring of Honor helped a little bit. They acknowledged Bullet Club. They would add uh, more and more people, of course, when uh, being the elite started, with when Kenny Omega uh, joined Bullet Club mm-hmm. uh, as the cleaner. In the as a junior, as a matter of fact, that's where Steam picked up, and basically Bullet Club and the the New Japan influence gave Ring of Honor a huge boost to a point where they were close to mainstream. But New Japan wasn't the only promotion that they were that they were working with because of, through this working relationship. Yeah, this was a three way thing with CMLL as well, which. I believe I believe is the record holder for the for the oldest promotion currently operating. They are they are indeed that older, yes. Mm-hmm. So and, that there's a reason why you see Roosh and El, uh, and Bandito involved in Ring of Honor, or they were involved up until the end, of course. And um, Dragon Lee. Dragon Lee, of course, yeah. Mm-hmm. But with and gra- granted, granted, some of this some of this was. Some of this was coattailing off of the, off of off of the ripple effect that was a lot of people getting exposed to Lucha Libre through through the other best kept secret at the time, Lucha Underground. Yeah, this was a triple A. Uh, this was triple A, uh, and a bunch of producers coming together and say, "Hey, Lucha, but with Grindhouse gimmicks." Yeah, and, and obviously this is the, 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 the that's the, the 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 long story short layman's terms of it, like the elevator pitch. Yeah, we will. It, we it will goes deeper than that. We will end up. Do, I can. I can guarantee you this. Sometime in 2022, we will be doing a special like this again on Lucha Underground. Because I'm gonna need to. Re- I'm gonna need to watch some Lucha Underground then. <laughs> well, fortunately, the whole thing's up for free. Uh, but the but the point is, we we started to see we started to see the um the opening salvos of this of this working relationship attitude between multiple promotions instead of promotions being adversarial to each other. Yeah, this was, it wasn't an all the time kind of situation, but it was on occasion. Ring of Honor and New Japan would work together Mm -hmm. in a uh, Honor Rising show at Kirk and Hall. That was successful. Uh, Same thing with CMLL when they did uh, the Fantastic Mania at the same hall. Mm -hmm. And of course, the the New Japan talent would go to Mexico and and, uh, and North America for World Worlds, Global Worlds, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. That that's the reason why you would have a Tomohiro Ishii winning the television championship. They were hardcore into that stuff. They wanted championships involved, uh, which is which goes into Michael Elgin and and uh, that working relationship is he, he uh, we will get to him. Uh, it also worked out for a particular gentleman called the American Nightmare Cody, mm-hmm. who had just been released. He had been started doing some indies. Long-term relationship being done. He just worked in some indies, and uh, eventually he would sign with Ring of Honor. And of course, being the elite was there to cover the the, the son of a bitch as well. Mm-hmm. This was like in the early thirties, forties in the episode count. If you keep track uh, on being the elite, of course, a lot of it was the YouTube show. The hot topic stuff would come later, but eventually you would you would see Adam Cole getting inv- involved. Adam Page, like they were that they were proper, they were a proper promo, they were a proper group in both in two companies. In that, that was a big relationship for them. Yeah, and um, other, and other part of the reason why that why Ring of Honor had mainstream success, even for a cup of coffee. Mm-hmm. However, now one one might one might ask, um, what 
what what um if they were if they were being if they're able to get this this level of this level of um mainstream attention and and even to the point where rolling where of all people I started to see Rolling Stone talking about wrestling which is something I never thought I'd see I remember looking at the video and reading the article this was 2015 where the main the, the uh mainstream virality of the Young Bucks and being the, the elite really started to rub off the promotions, both promotions, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say, I'd, I'd say, I'd say there were, um, there were two, there were two things that, that, that did not exactly help. The first of them was Junior Land's attempt to essentially be, essentially create their own super, in, their own super indie in the form of the black and gold era of nxt yeah this was uh they did it started as just again at nxt where i've become the uh, the the in-house developmental that's another story uh long story short uh they started to pick up guys like samoa joe uh and kevin owen uh, kevin steen and al generico who become kevin owens and Sami Zayn. although rumor has it Sami Zayn was the handler for al generico Though and, and El Generico is just in in, in Mexico enjoying a, a peaceful retirement. Yeah, I hear I hear he's running an orphanage these days. That's that's the rumor. That is the rumor. But I'd say the I'd say the other thing that didn't that didn't help is the fact that as I mentioned before, Sinclair Broadcasting does not like to spend money. No, they, they are notoriously cheap. And they were very, ch and they were notoriously cheap when it came to the production values. When everybody else was stepping up their game, even with even within other indies, they were they were stepping up their game. Whereas that, whereas um, Ring of whereas Ring of Honor's television still had still had the look of the an early, indie of of an of an indie, and don't get me wrong. I know I know some people don't like don't like the dark lighting. I actually prefer I actually prefer dark lighting over the overly lit things for a couple of reasons. One, um, when you when you ha when you have that much light, it's it's tough to know where your eyes are going to focus. And two, as I've made very clear over the years, I have a sensitivity problem with very bright light. It's one of those things like it like it's. It the simplicity that you could say, oh, it's 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 low budget, and it was, but at the same time, you could look at it and go, and well, it's different. Everything's so well lit that you, in Ring of Honor, in this case, you just need to do a little bit of, uh, it's just a little bit of, uh, you just need to, to have the ring well lit, mm -hmm. and everything else, you you turn on the house lights after the end of the of a match, and then after that, you just do whatever you need to do. Yeah. But I'd I'd say I'd say something that that didn't that definitely didn't help, and said and ironically enough, this is something that I can't really put bl I can't put blame on anyone in particular. It's the fact that the New Japan angle of the relationship started to o started to overtake. Yeah, a lot of it was because of Bullet Club and being the elite, being the 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 hyper focus. Mm -hmm. Basically, Cody had become the world champion at the time. Long story short, Bucks were the champs. Uh, you would have uh, Adam Page doing his quote unquote excursion uh, bumping between a New Japan and Ring of Honor. So would Adam Cole, mm -hmm. uh, and Marty Skrull would would join the fray as well. So a lot of influence, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the popularity, admittedly, came from Bullet Club, came from that. So there was no choice in going to that influence because, hey, you have something that's going to make money. What are you going to overexpose more? The, the guys that uh, may or may not be making money or the guys who are on YouTube crushing uh, or YouTube uh, and going viral almost every week? Mm -hmm. Especially when they try the D DX, DX Monday Night Raw taping. Yeah, and when it comes to when it, com when it comes to that, the other thing that didn't help was the fact that they would try that there were a few attempts of them trying to set up other stables with it within. When you the Kingdom are are, are are a glaring example of that. Yeah, 
and don't get don't get me wrong, I lo- I liked the ki- I liked the Adam Cole era of the Kingdom. I really did, <clears throat> but it's but it's the issue it's the issue of a stable a heel stable like that. It's it's one of those things where you end up having problems when you have multiple multi member um, heel stables. If you need another example of this, consider consider the whole consider the whole thing of having the Dungeon of Doom and the Horsemen in the sa- in the same promotion. Pretty much. Long story short, in this particular case, is simply they they were trying to, to capitalize on the success, and in certain cases, they were uh, successful. The Matt Taven version, controversial as it was, guess what, folks? They were heels. They were supposed to be controversial, mm-hmm. but at the same time, worked. Yeah. Long again, it's going back to New, New, to New Japan and Bullet Club specifically. Again, the virality that and the popularity. Look, Bullet Club shirts are on hot topic. What do you do? Do you say, oh, we're not going to do Bullet Club, or we're, they're just going to run with it and go, hey, we got a hot thing. They're under contract. Let's run with it. Mm-hmm. That's basically what they did. Again, you could say, you could say, oh, it wasn't as good, or that, that was a bad influence. Say what you will. They made money. And in wrestling, that's what counts. And now, of, of course, of course, even. Even throughout even throughout the years of its tenure, there was there were always the issues of talent raids. That was an inev- that was an inevitability. But yeah, the the um, re- but the re- the um ov- the over t- the bullet club effect, as it were. Yeah, de- definitely de- definitely did not help. Definitely did not help matters, especially when it came to bring. Especially when it came to making all of the in. How some Ring of Ring of Honor talent at the t- at the time end up lo- end up looking like secondary acts, no matter where they were on the card. And of of course, there were a few there were a few instances even bef- even before the Matt Ta- even before the Matt Taven experiment that were just that were just unfortunate. I'd say one one of the big one one of the bigger instances in this regard was was all of the all of the visa issues and all of the headaches that happened. With Michael Elgin's championship run, yeah, which is unfortunate. A lot of it was uh, they had dropped. I think the uh, yeah, a lot of it was uh, the, at the time though. This was also at the time of the Cruiserweight Classic, and mm-hmm. Elgin was not the only one having trouble. I could point to Speedball Mike Bailey uh, missing an Evolve show that would that had William Regal scouting. Rumor has it, there, heavy rumor has it, Speedball was. Uh, was considered to be one of the for the being one of the competitors for that for that tournament. Long, you know, in hindsight, bullet dodge, but at the, at the time, this was a huge controversy. Yeah. Uh, I think there was. I think there was also a bit of a bit of a thing where Elgin got heat because he may have been trying out for, um, for baseball in Canada. I cannot confirm or, or deny in that particular case. Yeah, I do remember. I do remember hearing stories going up, going about that he was, that he was at ba- that he was at baseball tryouts a few times. That big a dude. Well, Bartolo, Bartolo Colon's in in the MLB, so who knows? Fair, fair. <laughs> though, though, if I'm being if I'm being completely honest, um, ba- I don't I don't look at a guy like Elgin and th- and think this is a guy who should be in baseball. I think this is a guy who, if he's if he's in baseball, he's going to get hurt. Yeah, look, I'm not going to. I don't think it's worth going into into that part of of why he's uh, not beloved anymore. That that aspect, that's that that for me, that's more rumor than anything else. Yeah, I will say this: they tried to put people over over with uh, with, with the Bullet Club influence, and hey. Some some were winners, some were losers. That's that's just the reality of the situation there. But it is funny that you mentioned Adam Page because he's a lot of people looked a lot of people first looked at him during during his days as Hangman in Bullet Club. For me, I I've um that he is somebody that I have followed since his since his days since his days in decade. Hmm. 
that br that brief st that brief stable that ha that had um I think bu um Buzzsaw um Jimmy Jake Jimmy Jacobs and Roderick Strong and Roderick Strong was kind of the was kind of the odd man out because well as as phenomenal of a wrestler as Strong is, he's not he's not always he's always been kind of closed off when it comes to his persona. Yeah. And he's not somebody you have cut a promo. Not usually, no. No. But when but now of course now of course then the bigger issues with Elgin happened, which didn't exactly help matters. Ends, up, ends so, up making Ring of Honor look like they bet on the wrong horse. This and this would not be the first time, unfortunately, that, that some of those betting on the wrong horse or the some of the strange booking decisions we'll, we'll get into. But in this particular case, this was a little bit after he uh, uh, Elgin left uh, Ring of Honor. He had he had done what he had to do, and he basically started transitioned to into a career with New Japan, which. Before the shit hit the fan, never open weight champion, intercontinental heavyweight champion, which by the way, intercon IC champion against Kenny Omega, that the one the first ladder match in New Japan's history. That's definitely not it's definitely something to hang your hand on. Mm -hmm. So that there's there's some good things in the in this. But the controversy that uh, Monk brings up is is in the fact that he was alleged to have abused a few of his students at his at his training school. Now I say alleged, but again there was a lot of evidence still going against and apparently the and some of the heat that he had that Elgin got accumulated to a point where he had, had been essentially all but been blackballed from pro wrestling, pro yeah. wrestling. He had been exited out. I'd say it didn't exactly help that around this time there was that massive Actually, I, th I think it was a I think it was about a year beforehand, year or so beforehand. There was that whole controversy with Bill with Bill Demott. Yeah, the way Elgin trained was allegedly some similar, though it was not as destructive as Bill Demott. Mm -hmm. Again, this is alleged. This is rumor hearsay. So we are obviously speculating. But again, there's a reason why Michael Michael Elgin is not wrestling today. The the point the point is when one of those things happens there's there's a lot there's a lot of um a lot of more active eyes look, looking for this kind of thing or 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 be or not it or having very little leeway on shenanigans and to be honest this was before the speaking out movement this was at least two years like those allegations were very strong mm -hmm. now. Here. He was allowed to finish up his, his his run with with New Japan, but afterwards he was he had just been relegated to working indies. Mm -hmm. Now, the other the of the other main the other major one, and to be on, to be honest, this particular issue hurt um really st really stings for me because it involves one of my one of my favorite boys and David. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to get into Taven yet. I, and to, and to be fair, I will say. I will say with with Taven, um, I don't have. I don't have major issue. I, I never had major issue with him. But I'll get to that. We need to explain why that had because this will be part of the downfall well, of Ring of Honor. But let's well, go to your boys the, first. The other the other major thing I wanted to bring up was the whole was the was Ring of Honor betting a great deal. And this was this was right this was right in that right in that massive boom period that UK wrestling was was starting to get, mm -hmm. and that and them them putting so many eggs in the basket of the villain Marty Skrull. And again, that transition from uh, this was a lot of it explained. A, a lot of it was hyped up in in uh, being the elite. I believe the videos are still up there for posterity if you wish to explore those. The tra this was a way to transition Adam Cole out of the Bullet Club and it, and pretty much finish up his run as he had just been signed to WWE and NXT. Which hey, up until the bitter end, one of the bit one Adam Cole great run in NXT, all things considered. Mm -hmm. But 
they needed a guy to to fill that Adam Cole hole and a lot of fan support for the villain at the time. And it was obviously obviously when the the Bucks and uh, when when Ring of Honor had that tour in the UK, obviously there was a big UK boom at the time. Mm-hmm. They picked up Will Os the Will Osprey wrestle from Ring of Honor at at the time. So long story short, the trade was made. Cole left. Squirrel, squirrel is in, and a lot of buns, a lot of fun, a lot of uh, shenanigans came in, into play. This was. A, in, at least in the North American side of Bullet Club, the best formation of that. You had Cody Rhodes, Skrull, the Bucks. Both uh, Adam Page was still hanging around, and then, then you had uh, you would add uh, the 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 New Japan side every once in a while for for a little bit of spice and you know Tomatonga coming up with Bullet Club is fine, mm-hmm. <laughs> which was a wonderful fucking thing. So the, it, it had become Elite versus Bullet Club, and there is a whole lot of story lying to it. But uh, one cannot talk Marty Skrull, talk all that stuff. With, and this is one of the goals. It goes, it's going to go fast because it goes from Skrull joining, winning the TV title, Cody Rhodes winning the, the world title, all that stuff. This goes into the creation of what ultimately came ultimately became all in mm-hmm. because at the time the popularity of of being the elite and bullet club in general was at its peak and obviously the the infamous tweet of someone asking dave Meltzer if ring of honor could sell out a, a ten thousand seater dave said no cody read it said give us three months to promote and a building we'll fill it up now, obviously, it went a little longer than that, but a lot of a lot of stuff happened in in the meanwhile. Long story short, all in happens. You should watch it. You should watch it. It's on fight. It is available. If you got a if you got a twenty, it's it's there. The success of all in happens. Marty Skrull has a big match against uh, against Kazuchi Okada, which ironically goes. Way too over time to fuck up the main event, which was uh, Ibushi and the Young Bucks taking on, uh, I think it was uh, Rey Mysterio and not the not the Lucha Brothers. But... No, um, I remember I remember that Bandito was was involved. Bandito, Mysterio, and Ray Phoenix. I think if 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 memory serves, it's it has been a while. <laughs> Man. But it so the success it's it's it so Skrull the success of Ring of Honor happens and a uh, Ring of Honor pr- pr- helps produce the show they have so they share the rights all that stuff basically what happens all that happens big success and then the contracts are up not just one Connor Cody Rhodes Bucks Hangman Marty. Kenny in in in, uh, in New Japan is a little bit after uh, uh, of uh, a little bit after Wrestle Kingdom. Marty, now everyone obviously we all know what happens. Pay, basically, everybody signs with uh, AEW and joins in the formation of AEW. Eventually, Marty gets offered a little bit of money and part of the creative, a lot of the creative. Marty takes a gamble on himself, says, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with Ring of Honor. Now, this is not where the controversy is with with uh with, with Marty. This is a little bit after in 2020. But it does start with Ring of Honor joining up with New Japan, and instead of New Japan producing Sakura Genesis, they team up with Ring of Honor. To sell out Madison Square Garden. Now, this whole thing starts with the assumption that the uh, that everyone I just mentioned joining AEW or you know forming AEW mm-hmm. are still sticking around and just going to resign, and it's going to be a big you know big freaking pop of a party. And of course, the building sells the fuck out as soon as it's announced. Now. They couldn't control Kenny Omega leaving. They couldn't control 
Cody and the Bucks and Adam Page saying, you know, we there's a cra- batshit crazy billionaire with a brain. We're going to take the money and, and run. Marty sticks around. Obviously, support for Marty is, is huge. So, and he at this at this step. point in time, he part of the, part of the thing was he had, he had signed a lucrative multi year deal, and part of it was he was getting the book, and he was got, utilizing he got, was utilizing that to to um essentially down essentially downplay the Bullet Club thing and focus on on creating his own heel stable villain enterprises. villain enterprises, which would bring in luminaries such as BCO. Which that's another piece of the of transitional wood tool we'll get to eventually. Mm-hmm. Long story short, there's a lot of there is a lot of support for Marty Skrull. Mm-hmm. A lot of matches made for MSG. A lot of matches are made for MSG for the uh, G1 Supercard. Yeah. Now, if you've listened to my show, the Wrestlecast, which by the way, best and worst stuff at the end of the year will be uh, to well, I, I don't know when this will be posted. Probably the night of, so mm-hmm. later tonight. Uh, twitch.tv slash rbt entertainment 8 30 uh, p.m eastern 7 30 central we're doing best and worst stuff all that stuff blah 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 mm-hmm. when you listen to us the consensus that we had agreed on with this was the general consensus with everybody was show was great the crowd was hype but the new japan offerings and the crossover matches were fine the ring of honor offerings were not the ladder match. There was a ladder match, and it and it was for the Ring of Honor World Title. And while everyone was expecting Marty Scroll to be crowned the World Champion, Matt Taven eventually won. Mm-hmm. The consensus being, this was the wrongest booking decision, and that show at MSG was the beginning of the end. In hindsight, that's where you can see the downfall beginning. Yeah, and since we, since we, given the, given who's involved with it, I think this is a good time to talk about Matt Taven. Um, yeah. Now he was he was already on, he was already on the rise with the reincarnation of the kingdom and was already was already a rising star, especially given the um the run that he had with the television. Hey, title. he was running around with a purple strap version of the Ring of Honor title calling himself the real Ring of Honor World Champion, basically the uncrowned champion gimmick. Mm-hmm. So his he, so in fairness, his heel run was excellent. It was yeah. just the it was again re, the, the the Ring of Honor's uh inability to ring the, the read the room at the time that basically caused this by no fault of Matt Taven at all, but mm-hmm. It is what it is. Yeah, this was also at the same time where they were there. They were promoting the World of the Worlds tour, and uh, myself got a ticket to that. I will get to that when we get to that. I'll tell you what it was. I'll tell you that there were some comparisons to be made. Yeah, but the the point is when it came to when it came to that that ladder match. Um, I think a lot of people going into that were expecting that. Um, Mar- that Marty or Jay Le- or Jay Lethal would walk out. Yeah, if them. you couldn't put it on Marty, put it on Jay Lethal to, for the babyface pop. That made sense. Yeah, because with with the uh, with a place like Madison Square Garden, there's the lo- there's the long standing tradition going all the way back to the de- to the days of San Martino of let of leave the people home happy. In fairness to the to the bookers, whoever put the uh, the matches together, the smart thing to do was to put Okada versus uh, J uh, versus Jay White as the main event. By the way, Jay White was the IWGP World Champion at ta- uh, heavyweight champion, not world champion. Fuck that hideous piece of shit. But it, so, in fairness, Okada winning the belt in MSG was the right call in the main event. But on the Ring of Honor side, that tradition still has to be upheld. Yeah, it's a it's a case it's a case of different of different markets, um, different markets. And at that time, it was it wasn't just uh, Marty Skrull. He had resigned. He still had some contract left at it before uh, he even- inevitably resigned with the AEW. He had some time left, and so this was before he had the book. This was when Bully Ray had the book. Yeah, and 
I remember a lot. And Bully Ray had his favorites too, unfortunately. Yeah, that was that was unfortunate. That was he had, Bully. I'd say Bully Ray ended up ha- ended up being ended up being a repeat of the problems that happened with Jim Cornette, but to a lesser degree. Yeah, he still he still he still had some good sense, uh, but MSG was not his finest hour. Let's put it this way: in the uh, crossover match between uh, Tama between Tama Tonga and uh, Oh, so between G.O.D. and the Briscoes, at the end they brought in Enzo and Cass at, at a run, and that looked like they were that was their they, that was a shoot. Uh, those two idiots trying to jump the barricade thing. Turns out that was real, and a whole lot of people did not know that shit. Mm-hmm. I think that caused a lot that that caused a fracture in the New Japan Ring of Honor relationship, which goes into War of the Worlds. But we'll we'll get to that. Mm-hmm. And speaking of speaking of that, let's get let's get into the War of the Worlds tour. Yeah. So Matt Taven wins. People are pissed, and the Ring of Honor looks dog shit compared to New Japan. Uh, so the War of the Worlds tour happens a little while later, back in May. And by the way, 2019 was a hell of a year for me as a wrestling fan. I got to see a Ring of Honor show for the first time, which I don't regret at all. And, of course, SummerSlam uh, weekend, which was a great weekend as well. But that's another story for another day. Mm-hmm. So Ring of Honor gets advertised, and typically Toronto is a big, big wrestling city. Ted Reeve Arena, small arena, but big enough to, to hold a couple thousand people. So you expect sellouts. In fact, the year before, it sold. The Ring of Honor did indeed sell out Ted Reeve. From and not just like on the floor, like the entire building, standing room only. You couldn't get in if you didn't have a ticket because we ain't got no fucking tickets anymore. Kind of sell out. Yeah. So at first, I, so at first when they advertise, I'm like, well, wait a minute, could I pull it off? I look, I'm like, wait a minute, I could take the time off, find a hotel, cheap. Holy shit, pull the trigger. I'm happy in my head place. And it's like, it's like. Five rows behind, I got good seats on the floor of the damn building. Mm-hmm. So, get to the building. It's a little rainy. Get to it. Side story. I'm like the the dry, guy drops me off at the wrong side of the arena. Like it's a big communal thing. It's multiple ranks, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I go in. I'm like, it's it, the hockey. It's the hockey rink, and it's they're playing hockey. I'm like, wait a minute. I think I'm in the wrong one. I start walking around the back. Mark Briscoe's hanging around. I was like, all right, you're looking for the arena? I was like, yeah, yes, sir. All right, entrance is that way. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Low key, should have marked out more. Didn't, because I'm like, at this point, I'm more focused on getting the fuck away from this fucking rain. So, if Mark, so Mark, if you're listening, thank you. <laughs> That was very, very, that was very helpful of you, sir. Get to the building. People are happy. They're discussing that. Oh, wait, this is not a sellout. As if this is a big deal. It, it kind of was because it wasn't a sellout. I walk in. People are still filing in, but it's very slow. And uh, you walk in. Of course, uh, it's War of the Worlds. A lot of the New Japan stars are there, including Katsuyori Shibata, which if I got a picture with him it's my youtube uh, icon i avatar mm-hmm. on my page by the way I, that's still one of my proudest moments me doing the cross uh, the cross arms pose with him <laughs> dude i'm a mark I'll, I'll admit it i'm not i'm not deni- i'm not um passing judgment or anything hey if i had more money i would have had uh, pictures with uh, I, I had pictures with both shibata and uh bullet club with, with god with uh Hikuleo and uh, Tama and uh, Tama Tonga and uh, Tonga Loa. Mm-hmm. So obviously I'm having fun. If I had more money, I would have had a picture with uh, with Nagata as well. He was there and he was chill. Mm-hmm. We get to the show. And of course, I, I put my stuff down and a lot of stuff. I meet Dan DeMalf Lavransky. Uh, formerly of uh, live audio wrestling, now uh, I believe still doing uh, his thing with uh, Jason Agnew with uh, Saturday Night's main event. Mm-hmm. And he discussed previously that last year they were sold out. This year he had, did, he had mentioned that there was a steep decline. And it had been a, a major concern. 
we get to the show floor sold out basically one or two seats there and you, you basically filled out that and the hockey rink bowl the the the, the hockey uh, seats are empty you could see in some of the shots in the in the pay-per-view which you could get on honor club by the way you could see the in the background the the hockey seats are noticeably noticeably bare mm-hmm. fun show main event includes uh you know pco world champion he gets a he gets a pop it's it's pierre caldwell that in canada how can he not get a pop and his his recent resurgence Hey, I'm, I'll be one of the few defenders of PCO as Ring of Honor World Champion. Mm-hmm. He the fucker earned it. I mean, God, I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying to remember if he had a big bump, big monster bump. I don't think he did. No, actually, he was not World Champion then. He was facing Matt Taven for the World Championship. Mm-hmm. Had a great match. Great night. You know, people leave and all that stuff, and there's this this feeling of it's just not the same. Big names you could get on the show were God, who opened the show, and Nagata, who was facing uh, Silas Young. A couple of years ago, they had Hiroshi Tanahashi taking on Adam Cole. The year before, Tanahashi versus Kevin Steen. Okada was a big influence. None of them fly fly too. Didn't want to do it. Show was fun, but not eventful. Didn't have the pomp and circumstances of fast. Of course, a few months later, New Japan, it's announced that New Japan and Ring of Honor are parting ways. Going back to new to MSG, that's where you could say, "Yeah, this is where this is where it's all downhill from there." I'd say, I'd say the be- I'd say the best analogy would be the canary in the coal mine. Yeah, because when you know that obviously, like that, there, 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 there was no not a high demand for, it, but you know, you, you put K- Kazuchika Okada or Hiroshi Tanahashi in there. You could still, I don't know if you would sell out Ted Reeve, but you could fill it up even more than it did. Mm-hmm. But, and some, as much as I like you, as much as I like Yuji Nagata, there is, there is still, there is still the fact that a guy, a guy like him, a guy like him, even by, by the time the 2010s had arrived, he was, he was basically a, um, legacy guy. Let's put it this way: to to the modern discerning wrestling fan, yes, you respect Yuji Yuji Nagata. Mm-hmm. You enjoy it when he wrestles, but he's not Okada. He's not Tanahashi. He's not Naito. And he's none never- of those three were in that were were in the building that night. Yeah. I'd like to think that New Japan was starting to pull back its influence, and we're just paying lip service to the to the rela- to the relationship to limp the the rest of the contract or whatever agreement was signed or not signed or whatever mm-hmm. done, so they could move on. Mm-hmm. It was clear that they done the because the the relationship with New Japan and Ring of Honor was New Japan needed their foot in on the in the door for uh, for their U.S. market. They had had multiple attempts, and Ring of Honor was there to help them out. The MSG show showed not only did they not did they not need Ring of Honor to sell out at least in their mind they didn't need uh, Ring of Honor to sell out MSG. At that point, they had understood the the consensus of and New Japan was doing big business at the time. Mm-hmm. They didn't need Ring of Honor anymore. Ring of Honor need, needed them in a sense. Yeah, and I'd I'd say. Um... And that's that, a bad that, that's a bad sentiment to have. If you're Ring of Honor, that's a bad thing to have when it's time to renew talks. I think I think something else rega- regarding that that certainly didn't help was the fact that New Japan was New Japan was already was already putting out feelers to set to one um put a further emphasis on the LA dojo and two yeah. Do their do their own uh, do their own U.S. program, which they would eventually do in the form of New Japan Strong. Long long story short, a lot of things hurt Ring of Honor. New Japan losing interest in running in running shows concurrent, 
and the loss of the elite was a big factor of them and Ring of Honor losing a lot of luster. Not all it's luster. They still had a compelling program and they were starting with the women's division, such as it was at the time. Yeah. As much as I as, as much as I like man I like Mandy Leone, but I did but I did start to feel like the whip like the women's division was because was becoming a carbon copy of the knockouts division and impact. Yeah, it, it was a carbon copy, especially when you look at uh, people from uh, the beautiful people under a different name, which I will, I do not and will not Google it because I don't feel like do, doing that right now. Mm-hmm. But again, the influence of the blue of the beautiful people and uh, allure, whatever they want to call themselves. That's what that's what it was. The allure. It was the allure, and the idea. And of course, the women's divi- the women's division was established. It was just not treated with any attention or respect at all, to the point where, when uh, their women's champ, when they had to let go of their women's champion at the time, the championship went unnoticed until the pandemic era began. Yeah, it didn't help. They had just were... started too little, too late with Roxy. Mm-hmm. There was also there was also that um, controversy with um, Kelly Klein. That did not. That did not help their pub, their public reception. Yeah, Basically, Kelly Klein was a big reason for for the uh, dormancy, such as it was for of the Women of Honor Championship, which inevitably became the Ring of Honor Women's Championship, which is what it should have been called in the first fucking place. Yeah. The I'd I'd say I'd say one one particular one particular other canary was not all in itself. But what everybody, di- but what everybody did after that. Now, well, let's put it this way: this was the same. Uh, this was also the same month, or the, the the within the same month that Double or Nothing was what came into it. It came into be. They, they, it began to be to get a lot of hype from. Yeah. So, AEW had that the existence of AEW was known at the time. Yeah. WWE, the, NXT, this is 2018, 2019. NXT was still a very hot property as the black, uh, in the black and gold era. Mm-hmm. Um, pro- Progress and ICW were still ki- were still kicking ass in the UK. Um, this is where you could say the abundance of every promotion was there. Ring of Honor was a severely lagging. Yeah, I'd say the, I'd say another um, another fa- another fa- another factor. This is the reason why I bring up all in regarding this is the other thing that that pro- that cropped up in the aftermath of this that was starting to build up but we en- but we ended up seeing the return of of the NWA proper in the form of the sh- in the form of the weekly YouTube show NWA Power and eventually and getting NWA doing pay-per-views again yeah, it, it it all started with ten pounds of gold. Their their YouTube series in uh, in order to uh, to explain and, and uh, to explain the uh, relevant relevancy of the NWA title uh, with uh, Tim Storm, Nick Aldis, and and inevitably hit the feud between Aldis and Cody Rhodes. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, the first champion the first championship hap- uh, cha- uh, the first championship change happened at All In. One of the big one of the, that was one of the the uh, well, that that was one of the big uh, big matches at at the time. Mm-hmm. So a lot of influence happened. NWA starts their show with Nick Aldis uh, as world champion. So Ring of Honor was still Ring of Honor, but at the same time, a lot of the a lot of the people that liked Ring of Honor found their their uh, the style that Ring of Honor would deviate from. From the like NWA, if they liked it a little more old school, or uh, they would go to New Japan if they liked the more technical progress, ICW for the British style. If they just wanted a Ring of Honor, but with a WWE twist, there's NXT for you right there. And that's basically what it was. It, 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 NXT had become Ring of Honor, ironically. Everybody. I'd say I'd say it's a case of everybody was essentially taking taking notes from what Ring of Honor was doing, and do and doing their own spins on it. Whereas ROH themselves was wasn't was still trying to do the same setup that they had and didn't didn't adapt to the radical paradigm shifts 
that it was still a super the indie, and they were taking people from the indies, but it was sparse. Not again, not this is not a knock on PCO. He was a great world champion, mm-hmm. but and he definitely had earned a world championship at by that time, and that pop was definitely earned. But at the time, PCO was not what the discerning wrestling fan wanted. They 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 were happy to see it happen, but this is not something that was necessarily uh, desired. Would you for say lack that? Of would word. you say that PC, Would you say that PCO's? Uh, in fact, that when I when I look back at would it, when I look back at um, certain Ring of Honor champions, especially some of the some of the some of the one offs and even some of the bigger ones. Would you say that PCO was an example of the right guy at the right place in the wrong time? You could definitely argue that. I would say this is Ring of Honor trying to capitalize on the virality of PCO. He had a YouTube series where every Monday there would be some kind of torture device added to, put to him to make him look like he's not human. His gimmick it was basically Frankenstein on steroids. But an old man mm-hmm. being Frankenstein on steroids, but he could bump. Yeah. He, basically, his big thing, for PCO, was taking the biggest, most dangerous fucking bump possible. Mm-hmm. Safely, of course, uh, uh, top turnbuckle to the floor, bare, like, or basically a mat or just flat out bare. Yeah, it's a very Norman yeah. Smiley kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. But instead, it was instead of selling it and screaming, he would sell it by being fucking Frankenstein, mm-hmm. as if uh, he would sell it as if he had done a, a, a tope suicida or a tope tope Hong Kong hello and the crowd popped. Mm-hmm. But in re- but to further to further go to further go into that, I'd s- now obvious obviously. This this particular this particular um this particular motif of being a super indie was going with once once the once the um independent scene really started exploding with a lot with a lot of semi mainstream attention the pickings for developing independent talent we're going to get smaller and smaller when bit when a, when a bunch of other promotions were go- were going to start cropping up it was slim pickings they they inevitably they they signed a lot, a, gr- a good crop of talent and like the current roster up until the very the the, the, the bitter end was fair it was a very solid roster they would still have their regulars like the briscoes uh the bearsy bruiser silas young among other names and Jay lethal on top they they had brought in Roosh and Bandito, and uh, among other names. So their roster was still the Cheeseburger or the world's famous CB Danhausen, who had just started uh, his run with Ring of Honor at the time. Look, you can't say that they didn't know how to get talent. It's again, the baton was passed, or at the very least, taken to another promotion or several other promotions at that point. Yeah. Also, when also, given given what you had given what you had mentioned, I should I should say that I um I'd like to be a fan of the Beer City Bruiser, but he's from Wisconsin, so I'm legally obligated to hate him. Uh, yeah, look, I'm not going <laughs> to shit on that. And to be fair, he I believe he still is a heel, so there's yeah. that. Yeah, it's just if you, but I'd say, but I would say, I would say that. What's certain? While they while they were certainly able to get, well, they were certainly able to get na- get names. That this was what this was when the fact that their production style hadn't caught up to to a lot of their competitors really started to hurt them. They only started changing the style in the pandemic. Look at a lot of the LED stuff and all that stuff. Again, the production caught up too little, too late. Mm-hmm. In in this particular case. Thankfully, like the again, they're going back to present to the presentation of the uh, Pure Championship tournament with the graphical change and all that stuff. It was very subtle. The production, the value had caught up again too little, too late. And if you watch the uh, final battle, it's there's still that the influence of 
okay, we're going to have a crane, but that's it. Like er everything else, it's just the same. Which, by the way, they still had the crane, but the production was basically still the same, all things considered. Mm -hmm. What they changed, though, in the final months was they became a, a lot more analytical. A lot, that came with the uh, pure championship, but they just added to... They decided to add to it to it uh, to a varying degrees to the rest of the presentation, at least from the broadcast and graphical department and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. As far as just the presentation itself, it never changed and never went out of that uh, indie style. But at least from a production standpoint, the quality was a little better. It wasn't an out of right indie anymore. It was okay. It's Ring of Honor, but at the same time, now they they you know. They added some budget. Like, there wasn't any steel guardrails. It was just a, a plastic guardrail, mm -hmm. for example. And to be fair, when it came when it came to when it came to when it came to the pandemic, um, the unspecified virus of unknown origin, as um, critical drinker jokingly refers to it. <laughs> uh, usually, usually, human malware, as as Nash has as liked to use as well. Yeah. Um, they ended up doing the right thing. Where even though they even though they weren't running shows and the like, they still they still tr they still tried their best to to um keep it. To they the kept as many people, people employed as humanly possible. Uh, they would they would tape whenever it was safe. They would bulk tape a shitload of things. The pure tournament basically came to because of the pandemic. They just said, "Hey, we were going to bring the pure title anyway." Here's an excuse. The minute we're allowed to tape and do and do indoor wrestling again, when any capacity restriction or otherwise, we'll do it. That's what they did. They did, and they did. And you know what? In fairness, again, the pure the pure tournament in uh, 2020, one of the highlights of the year, actually. So again, can't knock it. Again, the presentation uh, they they were forced to add LEDs and all that stuff to make it look more production wise like between impact and ring of honor ring of honor had the better production value ironically <laughs> at least in the pandemic yeah in certain cases ring of honor still had the had the uh had the the market cornered in the cinematic department mm -hmm. at least you could say a lot of what they did was contributed to the to the downfall of ring of honor the 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 the, the end of ring of honor but at the same time, it it extended the the uh, warranty a little bit with uh, with the, the how they presented Ring of Honor. But in the last few months, if I'm being honest, I feel I feel like the inevitable decision that they made of do, of doing this shutdown, releasing everybody from their contracts, and hoping to come back with a new with a new look in April. Mm -hmm. I feel like that kind of thing, if maybe not in the same form, but something like it was inevitably going to happen this a lot of it you could thank joe coffer for delaying the inevitable in that case because you read up into it long story short uh sinclair ran into some money trouble and some ransomware trouble mm -hmm. <laughs> heavy ransomware trouble trouble to the point where a lot few of the shows building up the ring of honors uh final bell basically got unplayed because they couldn't have no one had access to, to switch out the tapes so to speak or the the video files long story short ring of honor had been operating at a loss from 2019 ish 2020 was supposed to be a good year for them turns out it wasn't and sinclair itself was running into a big money pit so to speak they had to cut they had to cut losses whenever they could Ring of Honor was the wasn't the big money loser for them, but it was a money loser nonetheless. Yeah, they want Sinclair wanted to switch it up long ago, but Joe Koff and uh, with help with the help of uh, Carrie Silk and a lot of uh, big players with Ring of Honor fought to keep Ring of Honor as it was until Sinclair got the uh, got the books back, and the the idea of the pandemic was quote unquote over. Grain of salt on that statement. I'm just saying when people when people are allowed to, to go to wrestling shows again, it became obvious that uh, Ring of Honor 
the obligation to the wrestlers and the and the and the staffers and everybody wasn't as important. And St. Clair finally said, no, this is happening. It is what it is. They, and of course, the announcement uh, tweeted and read and all over the place. That's basically what happened. Yeah. But the reason... But I, my... I ha- I've had a feeling that even if the pandemic didn't happen, something... They were thinking of shutting it down. Like, I'm willing to bet this was between 2018 and 2019 when, like, everything started to go down and then Joe Coff just decided, no, we're keeping it as it is. They're going to come back. They're going to be good. They fought the good fight, but inevitably Sinclair looked at the books, looked at the money and said, no, enough. This is it. There is no turning back. And I think it would have inevitably have happened in 2020, but obviously the pandemic, the pan, the global pancetta happened. And when it comes to, and that bring that brings us to the to the present to the present day, where um, I did see where for, first off they ended up they ended up having rotten luck at the at the eleventh hour. With because... with your current world champion po- testing positive for COVID, oh my god, that was bad fucking luck, mm-hmm. and everyone felt. I'm like, come on, let's get get when re- when it was announced Ring of Honor at Final Battle and a couple of tapings afterwards, like December, they're done. And the main event was Jonathan Gresham versus Roosh for the world title. Obviously, the idea was to give the the, the happy ending. Let's give Jonathan Gresham a, a, a courtesy championship reigns for for nothing else. But obviously, the build was final battle Jonathan Gresham, regardless of the ending of how the business end of it was going to go. The idea was the story was leaning towards okay, you're going to see Jonathan Gresham conquer Roosh and become the world champion. Mm-hmm. So that part was decided. And obviously Roosh tested positive and that threw a, a thing into a, a stick in the wheel. However, AEW came in clutch. They said, well, we signed, Ring- we signed Jay Lethal. We could ask, hey, Jay, you want to wrestle John the Gretchen? And Jay Lethal went, yes, sir, I'll do it. Yes, sir. Wait, 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 I'm not... <laughs> I had to do, but uh, sorry. With apologies to Black Machismo. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, he said obviously, obviously he he took to it and he wrestled Jonathan Gresham in the main event, which was a beautiful fucking main event. Mm-hmm. If 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 only hampered by the hard out at three hours, which I still call bullshit on. You own the pay per view get thing for God's sakes, but well, that's another story for another day. Yeah, at the very least, um. I will give I will give him I will give Gresham credit for the pro, for the promo that he ended up cutting after the fact when there was a, and the whole scene of basically a locker room sellout. Yeah. Um. And he's st- and um even even in the interim he's still he's st- he still has matches booked where he's going to be defending the title. Which and he's going to carry the uh, classic world title. Uh, which was presented by Kerry Silken at the end of the uh, of the night mm-hmm. uh, to close out the pay per view. Like literally, they 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 the the commentary crew signed off, and uh, the last voice you heard, Bobby Cruz announcing a new world champion. Which, hey, for the time constraints they had, that's a classy move. I think that was the best move to, to end it with. The idea of the locker room sell it was about halfway through the match, where people started trickle ringside and. You could tell the gravitas of the uh, the emotion of the event, which you could feel through. You could feel through the entire event. Matches were were wrestled, you know, in storyline. But the minute the final bell rang for their match, you could tell hatred was melted away, and kayfabe was forgotten for a minute. And just the the emotion of the event, the celebration of the event. There were hugs. There were shakes. There hands shaking. A little awkward in some cases, but at the same time understandable mm-hmm. so you you could tell there was a there was a sense of of welcomed finality and then ftr decided to show up and t and t is uh ftr versus them boys which that was fucking awesome mm-hmm. 
and all signs are pointing to are pointing to that happening. And yet, and yes, my body is ready for that. You say your body is ready, but truly, it is not. No uh, one is ready for them boys versus the absolute best tag team on this planet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you are never truly ready. You are your body is prepared. Yes, not ready. But with the. But with that said, maybe now maybe it's, this is just me. I know a lot of people are saying that this isn't the end; it's just the end of this era. But there is one thing that this particular move kept reminding me of, and it doesn't—it doesn't fill me with the degree of optimism. Are you thinking NXT 2.0? No. Oh, okay, fair. <laughs> Do you remember the paper the pay per view? that never aired from WCW. Oh, I believe the Big Bang, was it called? Yes. So, WCW was supposed to be purchased by Eric Bischoff and a, congl a conglomerate of people who want to buy WCW. Mm -hmm. This was this is go this goes back all the way to 2001 when it became clear that AOL Time Warner had basically told Ted Turner, "Fuck you, we're selling." Specifically, um, it was Jamie Kellner who had told him the who had told him to fuck off because he had hated wrestling for years, but Turner could always could always outvote him. Incidentally, and when with the merger of AOL Time Warner, Ted Turner's power waned. And that's a bit of an aside when it comes to Jamie Kellner, which is why I find his cl his claim that wrestling was low class. He would end up being the creator of TMZ. That hypocritical son of a bitch. <laughs> Pro wrestling has more class than TMZ. You want to know why? Because TMZ talks to the wrestlers, too. <laughs> but we digress. Yeah. Jamie Kellner says, we're done. Dub now, Eric Bischoff says, well, I know a few friends with some money. We could buy the company and... Mayhaps we could run uh, run out the contract, whatever it was, for the TV, and we'll, we'll fuck off when it's time to fuck off. Turns out, Kellner say no. The minute uh, the, the, the here's the hard date. This is the hard out. Afterwards, you're on your own. Long story short, Bischoff had the money and the people. The minute the TV was out, without a TV contract, WCW was worth peanuts. So they backed out. WWE, Vince McMahon walked in, said, a couple of contracts, TV, uh, the, the tape library, which includes the NWA stuff. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. How much? This much money. Soldier, son of a bitch. Two and a half million. But Two and a half mil. The original plan, if everything had, if, if it weren't, if it weren't for Jamie Kellner being a cunt, would have been... Would have been Nitro, the final of Nitro, Night of Champions, as as it happens. Yeah, maybe with a couple of minor changes, but it's Night of Champions as booked, mm -hmm. as it was originally booked by Eric Bischoff at the time. This was literally Monday Nitro. This was before it would maybe have been find out found out that uh, Vince had bought the company as well. Just keep in mind. So the card, as you saw it on that faithful uh, simulcast Nitro Raw was presented as is but show airs off the air for i think if, if it was i think the same amount of time with uh, with ring of honor about four yeah, to five months four, mo the, four months and four they, months they were going to they were going to move their production over to las vegas and basic and basically do kind, kind of what kind of what was kind of what was done with say it with say the impact zone or Basically NXT TNA. NXT also, yeah. Basically TNA. It was it was uh, it was going to be uh, their own show. They would have the TV again. They 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 not It wasn't uh, out at all completely TNA, where it was like weekly pay per views for nine ninety nine. This was the idea. Original idea was Nitro is back under a different manage uh, under a completely new management, independent of WCW. This would you know WCW would air the product. That's it. That's all they're involved. Uh, TNT would air the product. Or uh, Time Warner would air the product. That's all the involvement would be involved. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like WCW would own everything, and if they had a pay per view, they would make the money on the home video. Yeah, that kind of stuff. 
But the starting, the opening salvo was for this was supposed to be the Big Bang, and the reason we know about this is there what there were there have been plenty of posters in circulation about an, about this upcoming Big Bang. Basically, they had an agreement in in principle for the longest time, which prompted uh, the the uh, like for to for the production and the the TV commercial that has been mentioned. So a lot of the posters, a lot of stuff. And then brought up. Basically, they were ready, and the the, the ink, all they had to do was sign the contract and complete the transaction. Mm-hmm. That's literally what it became, too. However, we all know what happened with the TV deal that backed out the company, and basically, Vitz w- would swoop in, get everything, including ironically that commercial, mm-hmm. and of, of course, the rest is history from there. Yeah. Now, the. Re- that's the reason why. That's the reason why I'm why I'm a bit why I'm a bit cons- why I'm a bit concerned because usually usually if the if some usually whenever somebody does this whole thing of take time off to try to try and reset from to try and reset from scratch, it feels to me like a punt given the bigger problems that Sinclair Broadcasting is dealing with. It's only it's only been fairly recently that they've managed to somewhat resolve the ransomware problem. I'm not. I'm guessing they're hoping that they'll have their money problems fixed by then, and even even without that, the weeks leading up to final battle always had this air of fight of um. For the entire of yeah. Finality. Ever since from the, ever since the the, uh, the 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 announcement of final ba- battle being the final battle, mm-hmm. there was that as you said that sense of finality. The, the idea was, this is it. This is the end. We don't know if we're coming back. Mm-hmm. You, the idea is, they're not coming back if you look in the championships. Gresham is allowed to defend the championship. The Briscoes are the ring, reigning Ring of Honor World Tag Champs. We don't know what uh, Red Titus is doing with the TV title. We are assuming, we are to assume that that championship is, is defunct. Josh Woods is the pure champion, though we don't know if that's going to be defended or not. We all, all we know is that there are champions. They are allowed to wrestle with their championships. Roxy is facing Deanna Parasso in what will be a championship, a, a, a champion versus champion kind of matchup. We don't know if the titles are on the line or not, but we are assuming they may be. The idea, the the the, the basic gist of what we know so far is that the intention is to bring back Ring of Honor in, the, in a different presentation. And all talents are on a per appearance basis. They're not on a long term contract. The only the only thing is, if you are a champion, you're you would be legally bound to show up at the next show, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Everybody else, it's come as you go. If we book you, we book you. If you're not, you're free. You're you got a free weekend. Yeah, and the sweet uh, the sweet irony about the about the t- about the story of Ring of Ring of Honor is. The best way for me to describe it is that they en- is that in tr- in trying to do the right thing for business, they ended up fashioning a rod for their own back. More of a sort of Damocles, if you really think about it, because if this if the first show, th- th- actually no, this is Schrodinger. This is Schrodinger's first show. It is in the state of shit and not shit, or good or not good, depending. And the only way to find out is to tune in whenever they advertise their first show back, if they do so. Mm-hmm. If it is successful, great. If not, what we witnessed in December truly was the final. What was the finale? And we won't know until April. But I'd I'd say I'd say that the legacy. If it is the end, I would say that the legacy of a promotion like like Ring of Honor is a, is a case of the of the promotion that the promotion that could, despite everything working against it, but also a, also a dem, also a demonstration of the fact that, contrary to what Junior Land had believed for had believed for the longest time, there is not a one size fits all method of method of presentation and no matter how hard you try to present to present it as that one size fits all there are going to be those people who will dissent 
Oh. Yeah, that's why that's why TNA and Ring of Honor back in the day were were around in the first place. There was that person that they while they appreciated the one size fits all presentation of WWE, just wanted something that WWE either was incapable of presenting or refused to present. The biggest influence on Ring of Honor is in, with Ring of Honor isn't just that, though. Because they were not about the presentation. They were about the in-ring product. And you could see it all over the place. You know, you, with uh, Homicide, Low Key. They were, Low Key would be Senshi in, T- in TNA. Styles, Daniels, Joe in TNA. They pretty much pioneered the X Division, amongst others. You could throw in Jay Lethal. There's another influence there. AJ Styles, again, cup of coffee in, in a couple of places, but he was around. Big freaking deal right now. Nigel Beginnis in TNA. You CM Punk. No, do we need to say more? Throw in, throw in a name. Any name. Cesaro, you know, Claudio Castagnoli, that's Cesaro. Uh, Tyler Black. Seth Rollins. He, you could see... Tyler Black was a huge deal. Like he was still very young, mm-hmm. but Ring of Honor champion. As soon as he lost it, signed with the was signed with the Fed, and we all know that story. Successful as a motherfucker, hot chick as a wife, kid. Just um, success story right there. Just um, Rollins, stop tweeting, please. <laughs> The wife, do- the wife does the tweeting better than you do anyway. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Your man does that better. <laughs> but, you know, big time Bex can tweet better than you, pal. Don't worry about it. Yeah. You talk better, though. You talk better. But uh, let's read off the list some more. Uh, Davey Richards, Eddie Edwards. Mm-hmm. Maybe not as big, but they were, still, they were a t- great tag team in uh, TNA. Young Bucks. The platform for their popularity was Ring of Honor. Uh, Cody Rhodes, his revival, his his indie revival. Mm-hmm. A lot of the big success happened with with his Ring of Honor run. Adam Cole, baby, mm-hmm. another big example of that the only three time world champion or the the first three time world champion is you with Kyle O'Reilly. Big in Ring of Honor. Kyle O'Reilly, Bobby Fish, Red Dragon. New Japan, Ring of Honor, bit of both on this one, but Ring of Honor should still get credit for that. Mm-hmm. Well, the whole well the whole reason that tag team was formed was to run Davy Richards out, <laughs> basically. But I could go on. Mm-hmm. You, you'd name a name. He it pro- he probably wrestled in Ring of Honor, and yes, Kevin Steen versus El Generico, mm-hmm. the feud that never ends. You want fight forever? They fought forever. Mm-hmm. Literally, and in some cases, literally, the, the the list goes on. If they are a big name in either AEW or WWE or New Japan, really, because you you need to lump in Mike Luggan. He was a big deal. He was one of their big guy foreigner stars for a while. Mm-hmm. Chances are, they had an appearance, a short run. Or an influential run in Ring of Honor. They influenced Ring of Honor influenced the industry, if nothing else, in the production of its current of wrestling's current crop of stars. Yeah. And who's to say Danhausen was a viral name, and he had he had begun he had begun his run of Ring of Honor before uh, they shut down. But who's to say Danhausen had become a viral hit? You who's to say a couple years in Ring of Honor gets picked up by by uh, by, by uh, either AEW or it has an uh, even bigger successful run in, in the Indies? That's another influence right there. Mm-hmm. Long story short, Ring of Honor's long lasting legacy is what it's uh, said in, in its opening uh, in its opening stinger: a legacy of talent. They have produced stars, if not if not superstars. But the, they, they are the platform for generations of wrestling superstars. Mm-hmm. That cannot be ignored. And I would say I would I would say 
that. that and yes, Brian Danielson as well. But like, like we all know about Brian Danielson, yeah. folks. Let's not, you know. Also, also, but, um, Europe. We'll turn over to people who need to be put over. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, Europe. Fuck you. Oh yeah. For those who don't know, uh, they they said fifty dollars per play. Fifty th- fifty thousand per play. Fifty thousand. U.S. per play, as in, so if Danielson wins, that's a hundred grand to pay mm-hmm. per show. Mm-hmm. Fuck you. And I'd say I'd say that I'd say that particular, but that particular baton of be, of being of being the star making show is be, is being is being carried on through. Through a through AEW, especially especially now that especially with the um, NXT Black and Gold era, unfortunately over, it kind of split. Like for a while, Ring of Honor still had some of that influence, but AEW had picked up a piece of that. NXT had picked up a good chunk of that. So would Impact in a sense because they're building up their own stars. I mean, one example I could give you right now is Josh Alexander, oh, yeah. Moose, who had Moose, and by the way, Moose. Another name who had his big start with with Ring of Honor. There's another name, um, Mike Bennett. Yeah. Again, we could go on. Yeah, and um, incid- incidentally, the world needs more managers, and that's why I'm whether whether it's in AEW or somewhere else, somebody somebody throw some money at Prince Nana, please. Oh God, what he could do with. Yeah, you know, I, I no, I'm not even gonna imagine at this point. There's there's too many people to, that he could do magic with. It's not even funny. Yeah. Oh. Truth or team to a long, to a shorter extent, but I don't know if he's interested in in, in doing some he, more magic in the role. Reti- I think he's more or less. Retired, yeah. Which is a shame because I I love Truth Martini. Hey, he was resp- he he helped out Jay Lethal a lot in that heel run of his. Mm-hmm. But. The thing, but the thing of it, the thing of it is, is that is that with more uh, with more eyes on on re- on wrestling now, and more eyes on wrestling outside of Junior Land, the the that particular legacy is to, is be that is being carried by a whole by a whole new crop. If this ends up being the end, it is certainly not going to be the end of this. Partic- of this particular resur- resurgence of no of neo ter- of what you may as well call neo territories. In a sense, you you could see you know GCW has taken up the mantle of what ECW was. Yeah. And it's not just uh, the XPW where it's extreme to the to to the absolute extreme, or CZW where it's just, hey we'll just do garbage wrestling with with Danzig that'll keep us viable for twenty years. You knock it, folks, but it fucking works. GCW is that is is a new ECW in a sense. Ring of Honor was the solid number three and yet at times number two company in the entire U.S. AEW's pick up that mantle, but it now is presenting a a a, a truly unique product in in that particular case. Mm-hmm. Definitely a, a a great alternative when you think about it. Impact still kicking around and. Their owners, yeah, they 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 sold a lot of things to keep it running, but it's running and it's still semi successful. Or they're they're still on the air. Mm-hmm. Give them that. I mean, hell, T Dub and I and T Dub Shintai Girl and I fucking still watch that shit. It's still a good two hours of wrestling. Not the best, but not the worst. Mm-hmm. Ring of Honor, in a sense, had become irrelevant. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it, you could tell, like, in this conversation where Ring of Honor is, when the announcement happened, a lot of people with a lot of eyes, I'm fairly certain it was a great, a mostly successful pay per view, but it, it could have been a lot of it. it. Could have been pity. Could have been, hey, let's just watch it one more time to see see where they wound up, and probably wonder, wondered, wow, why did they shut down? And then you read into why they shut down and the myriad of reasons why they had to, and you go. Oh, that yeah, is, that ex- that is why I wanted to do this episode. It would be very easy to say that they were killed by the pandemic. I wanted to the do pandemic this is 
a good reason, but it is not the reason. Mm-hmm. As you, again, Sinclair, as we mentioned, had a lot of financial and ransomware troubles that did them in. I'm pretty sure they were they were breaking even before the pandemic, and in in a sense, the the idea of being generous and and trying to keep everyone everyone not only wrestlers but crew and had everyone involved with the company employed during that pandemic was probably one of the big reasons for the for the for the financial downfall. Again, the pandemic is a big reason for it, but it's not the the it is a contributing factor, not. Uh, the, the like there a lot of factors were at play. Sinclair wanted to shut it down. They didn't for the longest time. The pandemic was another re- probably ironically a reason why they stayed afloat for for so long. But it, it inevitably became like one of the reasons why they okay we can't keep this up. We're gonna lose our ass. Yeah. Now with the. But with that in with that in mind, I would say I would say the as I mentioned dur- as I mentioned during the Exodus trilogy, the I'd say the fu- I'd say the future of wrestling is going to be very interesting. And you are go- you are going to s- as much as you are going to see a lot of the- a lot of those elements um, carry carry onwards, especially especially since. What what some people what some people were a few years ago dismissing as a T-shirt company is as ma- as made it explicitly clear that they're here to stay and they're not going anywhere. Oh, they'll still sell you T-shirts and that you're gonna fucking buy. By the way, <laughs> including them that redeemed these nut shirts, that these nut T-shirt that you wanted to buy because it was fucking funny at the time. You know the one, but uh, no AEW will it has become as a comfortable number two and they are aiming to be number one but not going after wwe in that sense they're just doing what wwe ironically wanted to do in the first place mind their own business and do their own shit mm-hmm. ring of honor in this case where it lands if it, if it revives and it's a successful revival that is that's a mystery in its own sense. Mm-hmm. Like I couldn't give you an answer even if, even if I, even I don't even think Nostradamus could give you an accurate representation of what's going to happen to Ring of Honor. Mm-hmm. Success or not success. At this point, again going back to Schrodinger's uh you know, first show. You don't know if it's going to be good or bad, but you know it's going to be there eventually if they choose to do so. Mhm. It's it's gonna it's gonna depend on the on the talent they book, on what the presentation will be when the first show airs. Again, a lot of things still at play before to, to say, oh, this is a good thing or a bad. Mm-hmm. Even on, on a, a gut feeling from the trailer or the advertisement situation. Mm-hmm. To be continued. But at present, the watch has ended. And with that said, I will, I will say this: good. I will say this. I'm interested in seeing what happens to the Pure Championship. Mm-hmm. Who picks it up if Ring of Honor is done and the champions are defunct? And what are you going to do? I could see Ring of Honor pick it, pick up the, the, the Pure Championship and running with it. Wait, Ring. Um, you want AEW? Yes. I want to rephrase that. I could see AEW pick it up and running with it because they have a lot of technical badasses on that in that roster right now. Mm-hmm. Worst worst case scenario, if, if worst case scenario, you could always you could always hand it over to um, Suzuki Gun. That there, yeah. Josh Josh Woods could probably hang out with ZSJ for a little while. But, Heck, I wouldn't mind seeing ZSJ running with a with a pure championship. New Japan could pick up the pure title and run with uh, that. Could be a way of putting a championship on Katsuyori Shibata because mm-hmm. his his match for those wondering, he's he's made a comeback. He's wrestling, actually competing at Wrestle Kingdom under rules that that are very similar to pure championship. Mm-hmm. Now the opponents still to be determined, so. I couldn't tell you who it was or who it is, but at least at the time of recording. But again, if if 
if uh, New Japan wanted to run with the uh, Ring of Honor Pure Championship for a while, mm-hmm. there's Josh Woods versus Minoru Suzuki or Josh Woods versus Katsuyori Shibata under pure rules. Don't tell me you don't want to see that. I know I do. But with all that said, I would like to give a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty <laughs> more where that came from. I've got, I of course have the Valley of the Judge tomorrow and a few interviews in the intervening days, as well as the as well as um a com- a coming episode of the Monk and the Monarch. But until then, on behalf of the Good Brothers, present and not present. My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, and join the watch. <laughs>